All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your for, yep, like we're gonna get some feedback there. Um, thank you for your patience as we've been running a little bit behind this morning. Um, and thank you for finding the right room despite the con conflict between what was listed on the website and what was printed in the book. So happy to have you all here. As you know, this is the first, or maybe you don't know, but this is the first uh, topology, algebra, and geometry and pattern recognition uh, with applications workshop. This is a series, TAG DS caps encapsulates a series of workshops we've been organizing at ICML, related workshops at NeurIPS and others. Um, and so this is our first one at CVPR that we have also done one at ICCV. So thank you for being here as we kick this off. Um, we just wanted to kind of share uh, a couple of details. Um, this is our organizing team. Uh, four of them are not able to be here in person today, so the two of us, if you have any questions, if you are a speaker, we will be here, a resource um, and a point of contact in general, if you have any questions about TAGVS um, or would like to be involved. Um, we have two fantastic uh, keynotes today. Our first one, Nina, will be getting us kicked off here at nine, and our other Vitali is in the back there. He will be um, giving us our post-lunch uh, keynote. Um, so please be sure to stick around and come back after lunch. Um, the schedule is up on our website. It is also, um, I believe, on the CDPR website. So we will be staying to this. If there are people who are unable to join or things like that, we will skip a talk and resume so that people can come and we will stick clearly to this version of the schedule. Um, just a couple of logistics. We opted to have all talks live, so they are not pre-recorded. So some of them will be virtual, some of them will be on site. Um, they are going to be recorded from Zoom, and so we will be able to make them available after the event as well. Um, if you are in the room or on Teams, we will be indicating when you have about five minutes for the spotlight talks. Um, we will then more assertively in the room, that means I will stand up um, <laughs> to let you know you have two minutes left. Um, and we will figure out which way we're going to do that on Zoom, but we will be sticking to that schedule again. Um, all of the breaks you may notice coincide with the overall CVPR breaks. So they're a bit longer. Um, I believe our first break is at 10 a.m. Um, after Nina's talk and will be for 45 minutes. So then please, uh, please resume um, in this room for the rest of the day. Uh, we will also be updating Twitter throughout the day with photos and things like that. Um, so please feel free if you are enjoying things or have comments to tag us um, at, at tag in DS. And then just a very last couple things, some upcoming events. Um, these, we have a workshop coming up at ICML this year. There was a proposed workshop led by Nina and some of her fantastic colleagues that will be happening at, hopefully happening again this year at NERPS. Um, there's also a AMS mathematical research community next summer that has a lot of tag flavor to it. So if you have students or you yourself are interested in it, um, please let us know. Um, and then we are, of course, also hoping for additional workshops next year. And so then with the final thing before I switch it over to our first keynote is just some acknowledgements that these events um, really only take place when there is an active community engagement. Um, and so all of the people who submitted to the workshop as well as participated in the review process and are here in this room, thank you for bringing your energy um, and efforts to this particular community. So with that, I will stop sharing and I will move this over to you. Thank you.
I'm unmuted. Would you like the formal version of the whichever you <laughs> happy to provide all of the honor? You can butcher my last name. You could do everything you want to <laughs> You can butcher my last name. It's it's me away, right? Yeah. Is it how, yeah. <laughs> sorry, that was the total American way of saying uh, yeah, 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 that's name. New Orleans. Yeah, that lane is long. I knew I was completely wrong. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's me. Oh, come yeah. over to the mic over here. Um, so we will get started with our first keynote of the day. This is Dr. Nina Mialan. Uh, she is at UC Santa Barbara, um, has a very extensive experience having worked in startup in Silicon Valley, as well as in academia. We are lucky to get to organize future events with her as well. Um, so with that, I will let her take it away with a survey of topological neural networks. Thank you, Keegan. Thank you very much for the introduction. And also I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together this fantastic workshop and all of you for uh, being here today. I'm delighted to be here today. I'm gonna talk um, about a survey of topological neural networks. So I'm gonna give an overview of this recent yet very fast growing and very exciting field of topological deep learning and show you how it extends geometric deep learning and how it is different from another topology related field called topological data analysis. So the goal of this presentation will be to give you the keys to understand what are topological neural network and to summarize the literature on topological neural network in this table here, where each topological neural network is represented by what we call a tensor diagram. And as such, we will be able to see what are the current trends in that field, what are the challenges that the community is already facing, and maybe most importantly, what are the most exciting research directions that we should tackle. This presentation is based on two preprints. The first one is titled Architectures of Topological Deep Learning, a survey of topological neural network, and it is a joint work with Mathieu Papillon, Sophia Sandboard, Mustafa Ajij, and myself. And I'd like to highlight the first author, Mathilde Papillon, who has done an extremely good job at summarizing this mathematics heavy literature, and who also has put together most of the slides that you're going to see today. The second preprint that this talk is based on is titled Topological Deep Learning Going Beyond Graph Data. This is a longer preprint of 90 pages that gives you everything you need to know in terms of the mathematics that support this growing field. And this is a collaboration with much more people in a team that we call the PYT team. All right, so the outline for the talk today, um, whose goal is again to give a survey of topological neural networks. The outline is like this. First, I'm going to give a gentle introduction to topological neural networks and explain what they can do for you, what kind of data they can analyze, what type of knowledge they can extract from this data. Then I will present a graphical framework, so pictograms that we can use to break down any topological neural networks into its essential components so, how, so that you have the keys 
to understand what these topological networks are and that you can compare existing topological neural networks that exist in the literature. And in the third part, we'll use this graphical framework to do a graphical survey of the literature. So in that figure, we can summarize every topological neural networks using our pictogram. And what is going to allow us is that we'll be able to see what are the trends, the challenges, and the opportunities for future research in that, again, emerging, but very fast growing field. All right, starting with a gentle introduction to topological neural networks. So at a high level, topological neural networks can extract knowledge from data by exploiting relations between the components of a system. So what are these systems? A first example of system could be a social network, here represented as a graph. The components of this system are the people that are also the nodes of that graph. And the relations between the components are the social relations between these people, here represented as edges of that graph. So a system can be a social network with social relations. But a system can also be a drug interaction network, where each component here is a drug or a protein, if you wish, represented as a node of here a graph. And the relations between the components are now chemical relations between the drugs. Uh, and these chemical relations are represented as edges in that graph. So a system can be an interaction network where the relations are chemical relations or the existence of a chemical relation. And the last example, going to the physical or biophysical world, a system can be a molecule, a protein, here again represented as a graph, where the components of that system are the atoms that made these proteins, here represented as the nodes of this graph. And the relations are the electrostatic relations between these atoms that form covalent bounds, here represented as the edges of this graph. So a system can encode biophysical relationships between uh, these components. OK, so we said that topological neural networks allow us to extract knowledge from this type of data. So what kind of knowledge can we extract from systems where components have relationships. Well, topological neural networks can allow to answer questions such as, will Alice engage with this content? So assuming that Alice is one of the node of this social network graph, I can answer this question through a classification task. And importantly, this is a node-wise classification because Alice is a node in that uh, network here represented as a graph. In the context of the drug interaction network, topological neural networks can answer questions such as, does this drug interact with this other drug? And again, this can be phrased as a classification problem, but here the classification is edge-wise. I'm considering two drugs and the chemical relation that exists in between these two drugs, and I wish to classify that relation or that edge. And lastly, in the context of the electrostatic relations between the atoms of a molecule, we can answer questions such as, will this molecule bind with this ligand? And so now it's again a binary classification problem. Yes, no, no. But now it's at the level of the whole system, of the whole graph. The whole graph to the whole molecule will be associated a binary label that is either yes or no. Now, interestingly, these three questions can also be tackled by what we call graph neural networks. And as a matter of fact, these three systems are only graphs right now. They are made of nodes and edges. So what do topological neural networks bring to the discussion? Well, we will see that topological neural networks can extend graph neural networks by leveraging non-binary relations to give better answers, we'll define better, and to answer more questions about these systems. So they leverage these non-binary relations or non-pairwise relations. 
That means that, for example, in the social network system, we may want to incorporate more knowledge about our data set. Maybe we have information about these three people sharing something. Maybe this social network is a network of academic researchers and the relationship denotes which papers they have authored together. So maybe there is a paper that these three people have co-authored together. And we want to add that information to our system in order to give a more precise answer to the machine learning question. So this is to give better answers than graph neural networks to the same question. But topological neural network also allow us to answer more questions. So in the center example here, which is the drug interaction network, we may want to answer the question, what is the interaction that is created by taking these four drugs together? Because maybe taking only drug A and B together is not gonna have any side effect for your body, but maybe taking these four together is gonna generate a unique set of chemical relations and have adverse effects to you. So that is the polypharmacy side effect problem. And lastly, in the third example, we may want to incorporate the fact that these six atoms are not only linked by pairwise covalent bonds, but they also form what we call a benzene ring, which is denoted by this dashed, this dashed line here. And this means that this benzene ring has additional electrostatical properties in addition to uh, the covalent bonds that form each pairwise relations. So topological neural networks can extend graph neural networks by leveraging this non-binary, non-pairwise pairwise relations to either give better answers to the questions that we can ask to graph neural networks or to answer more questions such that tackling the polypharmacy problem. In what follows, I'm gonna use the following diagrams. So binary relations are gonna be represented with a graph. So the nodes in blue of that graph are the components of the system and the binary or pairwise relations are gonna be represented by the edges between the blue nodes. And by contrast, in topological deep learning, I'm gonna use the pictogram that is on the left to denote non-binary relations. So you can see that on the left, we still have these six nodes, but now they are linked with more than just edges. We have a relation in pink that includes three nodes, for example. And not only that, these relations have different colors. So we have a relation in light pink that includes two nodes, but also a relation in dark pink that includes two nodes. So we're gonna be able to incorporate more information in terms of the relations between the components of our system, not only moving away from non-pairwise relation, but also introducing a notion of ranks between the relations between the components of the system. Okay, so let's go a bit more into the details and explain what we mean when we say that topological neural networks extend graph neural networks. And first, what are graphs neural networks? This is a diagram that represents a graph neural network at the bottom here. As usual neural networks, it is constituted of several layers. Here, two layers plus the initial layer that is nothing else than the data set. So in a graph neural network, we start with our data, our relational data that is here. The relational data is the system made out of components, which are the nodes, and the pairwise relations between these nodes. We also have features associated to the nodes and sometimes also to the edges of the system. And we would like to send that data through the graph neural network to answer a question or make a prediction. For example, if the graph that is the data represents a molecule and the feature represent, features represent something related to the atoms of that molecule, maybe their mass or something. The prediction could be, could help answer the question to which ligand does this molecule given at input bind? And the way we answer that question is but by 
updating the features of the graph through the different layers of the graph neural network. So in the input, the features are just the data. But in the next layer, while the graph here is unchanged, the graph is still the molecule, the features that are associated to the nodes and the edges have changed. So you can see we have different colors here than the colors that were given as input. So through the layers of the graph neural network, we're going to update these features until we reach the last layer of the neural network where we pull together the updated features to make a prediction here to answer a three class uh, classification problem. Okay, so now how are the features updated? This is what is represented with this dashed gray line that represents what we call message passing. So the way the features are updated is called message passing because it has a nice interpretation in terms of propagation of information. And more particularly, if we look at this node here in blue that has a new feature here, we can think of that feature being the result of messages that have been sent to this blue node by other nodes. So there is an information propagation interpretation and we'll go more into the detail. Now, topological neural networks extend graph neural networks, and they are built in the same way, except that now, instead of having the graph that was supporting our data, the features, now we have a more complicated structure, we'll call that a domain, which has non-pairwise relationships, and these relationships are also ranked, supports the features, but the rest is the same features are updated from layer to layer through a mechanism that's called message passing. And at the last layer, we make a prediction to answer here the same question that the question that was asked to the graph neural network. Importantly, in the message passing scheme, so this dashed uh, line, you have the weights, the learnable weights. So in the context of a supervised learning classification problem, you will put different molecules through this graph neural network and update the weights of each layer until you reach uh, a good uh, prediction accuracy. All right. Now, why do we need a literature review of topological neural network? We need it because there have been two confusions about what topological neural networks and topological deep learning is. The first confusion is the following. It's a confusion between a related field, which is called topological data analysis, which at least for the wordings I'm using today is very different from topological deep learning. So you might have heard about topological data analysis. It were, it's a field that emerged about a century ago, and that has been more recently applied to machine learning and even deep learning for example, in the two papers cited here. So topological data analysis uses different tools. The most known one is called persistent homology. And the goal of TDA is to extract topological features from the data. So maybe I have a data set that is a point cloud, and I wish to know if this point cloud forms a torus, forms a sphere, basically what is the shape of the data. And then I can incorporate this topological or geometric feature into a classical machine learning algorithm, into logistic regression. I can even incorporate these topological features that I just extracted with TDA into a neural network. For example, with this paper, topological graph neural network. But this is different with what I'm gonna call topological deep learning here. Because topological deep learning already knows the topological features of the data set. It is not about extracting them. I already, knows the, I already know the topological features, which are the relations between the components of my system. And I want to exploit these known topological features to have more expressive uh, neural networks. Question? Silly question, but who was it in 1947? Surely it wasn't the on that one. Okay, I'll... Okay, thanks for the comment. All right, and the second mass confusion, which is the reason why we need this uh, literature review, is what I call notation chaos. 
So across the works that have been published since uh, for a few years ago, uh, you can find these type of equations. Um, it's because the field has been mathematic has been driven by mathematicians. And so what is in these uh, papers is often mathematical heavy. And more than that, different authors are going to use different notations. Because maybe a slightly different notation is more suited to their current application. Actually, the notations that you see on the screen all represent the same thing. Yet, it's difficult, at least to me, to see that they are representing the same concept. And so this notation chaos makes it difficult for practitioner to enter this field. So I'm working with biomedical data. I know that there are relations between the components of my system, but I have no idea how I can use the research from that field. And not only it's a problem for practitioners, I would say it's also a problem for all the mathematicians working in that field because it is hard to compare a new model with the past model without having to go through the trouble of rewriting all the equations. And by the way, as a result of this literature review, I'll mention it in the end, we have rewritten all the equations of the papers of topological deep learning. It's available online on the GitHub repository. Okay, so that was the introduction to uh, topological neural networks at a high level. These topological neural networks are neural networks that extend graph neural networks from geometric deep learning and allow to compute with relational data. Now I'm going to introduce a graphical framework to give you the keys to understand any topological neural networks, neural network, and more particularly to break a topological neural network down into essential components. And to each of its essential components, we're going to associate a pictogram so that we can give a graphical survey of the literature review. Stating the goal in English, our goal is to provide an intuitive graphical framework that is going to elucidate the topological domains, so the different kinds of relations that we can incorporate in the data, and the deep learning mechanisms that are used to do this message passing operation that we see in the literature. We're going to break this framework into three parts. One, the topological domain, which is this thing, which is the domain that supports the features. So the domain, a social network, a molecule. Two, the neighboring structures. So this is not necessarily illustrated here. Neighboring structures represent a choice that is made by the researcher in terms of how features can be updated from one layer to the next in terms of, more particularly, which nodes can send information to which other nodes, or which edges can send information to which other edges or faces, etc. And third, message passing. So we'll explain what these gray dotted lines are. Starting with the topological domain domains. So the domains of topological deep learning on the right generalize traditional discrete domains on the left in that they can allow you to incorporate more precise information regarding the relations between the components of your system. So relations, for example, social relations between people in a social network. In the traditional discrete domains, we have a set, a set of data points with no relations model whatsoever. And we also have the graph which model pairwise relations between any between pairs of components of the system. Do Alice and Bob have Alice and Bob co-authored a paper together? Now, the, the domains of topological deep learning generalize the discrete domains by incorporating, by being more flexible in the way we can incorporate relations between the components of a system. And we can do that in two ways. First, adding part whole relations, and second, adding set type relations. In the part whole relations, we find the simplicial and the cellular complexes. Now, these domains add notion of faces. So, for example, triangular faces or volumes, for example, tetrahedrons. 
And they represent pothole relations because they have this constraint that any face needs to be bounded by edges. Any volume needs to be bounded by faces, etc. So in some sense, the face contains the edges, the volume contains the faces. Now, the simplicial complex has rigid geometric constraints, uh, which are that the faces have to be triangles, the volumes have to be tetrahedrons, etc., which is a rigidity that is relaxed by the cellular complex, where faces can be squares, they don't have to be triangles, or volumes don't have to be tetrahedrons, etc. That's for the pothole relations. Now, in terms of the set types relations, we have the hypergraph. Now, you know that in contrast to the simplicial and the cellular complexes, the hypergraph does not have notions of faces and volumes. We are still working with only nodes in blue and edges in pink. But it generalizes the pairwise relation of the graphs in that edges in pink can now have more than two nodes. So, for example, here, we see an edge that has three nodes, and that is therefore called a hyper edge. But there is no notion of pothole relations. It's just that the edges can be larger and they're not subset of the data. So, for, for example, these three others have co authored the paper together, which doesn't necessarily mean that these two authors have co authored the paper with only them two as others, or that these two have a paper with only them two as others. All right, so this is a bit abstract. So let's see how uh, these domains can be used to represent relations in actual uh, data sets. And let's start with uh, the simplicial and the cellular complexes. Now, these two domains are very powerful in representing geometric data. For example, uh, the molecule shown here. Using the simplicial complex, you can add triangle. So you can add the information that you have cyclopropane triangles in your molecule. And with the cellular complex, you can also add non-triangular faces. And so it allows you to add the benzene rings that are here. These two domains also are very powerful in representing meshes. So another type of geometric structure which is what's shown here with the two meshes. The difference between the simplicial and the cellular is that in the simplicial case, faces have to be triangles, whereas in the cellular case, you can have faces that are pentagons, octagons, or things like that. Now, moving to the hypergraph case, here we have an interaction network of proteins. And thanks to the hypergraph, we can model the fact that proteins A, B, G and F are interacting together. If you have these four proteins, you're going to have a chemical reaction. And this is not a pothole relation because these four proteins interacting together doesn't mean that if you put only protein A and protein G together, you're going to have a relationship or a chemical interaction. And lastly, in the center, we have the more general domain, the more flexible domain, which is the combinatorial complex domain that incorporates ideas of both the pothole relationships and the set type relationship. So it can extend the cellular complex in the way the cellular complex was representing this protein, because not only we have the geometric structure that we get from the cellular complex domain, we can also add the functional structure of this molecule. So we can add the fact that these six atoms form an amino acid, or that the three atoms form a carbocyclic acid. So not only we have the geometric aspect of this molecule, we get the functional aspect of this molecule. And the combinatorial complex also extend the set type relationships of the hypergraphs because it can represent the protein interaction networks by adding more um, knowledge to it. So now you see that the sets that represent the chemical interactions between the protein have colors. We have pink for a low interaction and maybe uh, red for more powerful interactions. Yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand the interaction. Mm -hmm. 
Is it is it basically a more richly tagged photograph? A more rigidly? Is it more, a more richly uh, tagged? And it is, is it a hypergraph where some of the hacker edges are lecturing to each other? Yes, you can see that way. And that extra information will be a notion of rank. So here represented with only two ranks, a light pink and a darker pink. But you have a notion of yeah, ranking between the, the relations in the hypergraph. You can also see it as a generalization of the cellular complex, where you do not have the requirement that the lower rank cell is included in a higher rank cell. So for example, this edge here is not included in that phase, is not included in that phase. So you break down the part of a relationship. So the difference with the cellular complex is that it helps force the existence of lower dimensional cells? Yes. Yes. Because I don't I don't see how that's uh, that's two edge in, in the cortical complex couldn't be represented in the cellular complex. Because in the cellular complex, as in the regular cellular complex, any phase needs to be bounded by edges, which means that the edges, which are in lighter pink, have to be included in the phase. Now, if you move to irregular cellular complex, which is something you might be more familiar with, then you'll be able to have more exotic structures. Great questions. Thank you. And so how do we choose between all of these topological domains? Where in order to choose the topological domains, it could be interesting to go back to the questions that we want to ask to our relational data. So for the three domains on the left, it could be what are the properties of this molecule? And if you believe that adding the functional groups or more information about the relationship between the atoms of this molecule can help answer the question, it seems intuitive that you would want to use a more flexible domain that allows you to incorporate this information that you believe will help answer your question. And similarly, for the case of the hypergraph here, if we want to know if uh, two drugs interact together or maybe four drugs interact together, then we may want to have something that is more general than a graph. That being said, it comes at a cost. So it's great to use this more flexible domain to incorporate more information in terms of the relational data. However, you might be paying this in terms of complexity. So you're adding more structures. And so therefore the message passing scheme that we're gonna see is gonna be more costly. So you need to ask yourself the question, do you believe that this additional rational structure will help answer the question? Okay, moving on to the second part of the framework, which are the neighboring structure. And this notion of neighborhood is really what gives the name to topological deep learning. So what is the neighborhood of a cell? Here, I use the word cell to refer to either a node, an edge, or a phase, a volume. The neighborhood of a cell is loosely defined as cells, all the cells, all the nodes, edges, faces, and volumes that are close to that cell in some sense. And the fact that they are close to that cell will mean that they can pass messages to that, to that cell within the message passing scheme that is used through the layers of a topological neural network. Now, I've put quotes in all of this because this notion of neighborhood and closeness is basically up to the researcher. So the neighboring structure will be chosen by the researcher who is designing its topological neural network. For example, the researcher might choose that the neighbors of this face, this bending ring, are these three other faces, the two triangles and the other bending ring. Or the researcher might choose that the neighbors of this node here, which is an atom, are the three covalent bonds that are next to it. Or the researcher might choose that both are true and that we have different types of neighbors, neighborhoods uh, for this one molecule. Okay, so there is a choice that needs to be made by the practitioner or the researcher designing a topological neural networks. What are the different options? So a cell Y, and again, the cell is either a node in blue, an edge in green, or a face in dark pink, has, roughly speaking, four possible neighborhoods. There are more. I mean, you can define whatever you want to be a neighborhood, but there are four 
common choices. The first one is the neighboring structure of the boundary. The boundary is defined, so the boundary of a cell Y is defined as the cells of ranks minus one that are connected to it. So for example, if we consider this edge Y in pink, the boundary of this edge are the two nodes that are connected to it, which are the two nodes here in blue denoted by X. And likewise, the boundary of this space Y are the three edges that are one rank lower and connected to it. So at the high level, the boundary structure will allow us to send messages in the message passing scheme in between layers of the neural network between cells of rank R to cells of rank R minus one, from edges to nodes or from faces to edges, et cetera. And the way it's gonna be done is through the use of a matrix called the boundary matrix. One example of which you can see here, it's basically a matrix of zero and ones, sometimes minus ones if you have orientations uh, within the simple complex. Um, but basically it is expressing the fact that A is in the boundary of the edge AB, but is not in the boundary of the edge of the face BCD. This is a boundary matrix, zero and ones. The second neighboring structure is the co-boundary neighboring structure. And it's in terms viewed in terms of matrix, nothing else than the transpose of the boundary matrix. And so the co-boundary of a cell Y corresponds to all the cells that have one rank above and that have Y as their boundary. So for example, the co-boundary of this node Y is all the edges one rank higher that are connected to it and that have Y as their boundary. And likewise, the co-boundary of this edge Y is all the faces X that are connected to that edge Y and that have that edge Y as their boundary. And we're gonna, in the message passing scheme, we're gonna use the transpose of the boundary matrix, which is gonna give us a matrix of zero and once again. The third neighborhood structure is the neighboring structure of lower adjacency. So lower adjacency is defined as all the cells that share a boundary delta with Y. So for example, the adjacency of this edge Y is all the edges, same rank, that share a boundary that is a node with Y. And likewise, the lower adjacency neighborhood of this face Y are all the other faces, same rank, that share a boundary that is an edge with that cell Y. So it allows you to send messages from cells of same ranks. So from edges to edges, from faces to faces through the boundary they share. So for example, Y will be able to send messages to X through the node it shares with it. And we go, we share, we go through a boundary. So we go through a node that is one rank lower. Uh, that's why it's called the lower adjacency. And by contrast, we have this notion of upper adjacency, which corresponds to all the cells X that share a co-boundary delta with Y. So we'll be able to send messages from cells of the same rank, but this time by going through the co-boundary, so by going through a cell that is one rank higher. For example, the upper adjacency of this node Y is all these other nodes, same rank, that share a co-boundary that is an edge with Y. And that is the more known notion of adjacency that you might know from a graph. This is the adjacency matrix or the adjacency structure of a graph. But we can also have it for the edges. So for example, these two edges are in the upper adjacency neighborhood of Y because they share a co-boundary with it, which is the face here. And so this allows us to send messages from cells of same rank by going through a cell of one rank higher. 
So we have these four neighboring structures that we can choose from, or we can design our own neighboring structure. How do we choose? Well, first of all, it depends where you have features. So if you don't have any features on, uh, let's say, the faces, because you have a graph, then you cannot use the upper adjacency of the edges, because you cannot go through the faces. And then it really depends on which is going to work uh, the best uh, for your problem. And we're going to see that different architecture have made different choices. Going to the third part of the framework, which is finally the message passing. So the message passing is really going to define the topological neural networks. And actually, when we're going to describe the topological neural networks of the literature, we are really going to define what is their message passing. So we're going to identify a topological neural network with the mechanism that updates the feature from one layer to the next. To represent that, each layer will have this pictogram associated to it for each of itself. So I'm going to use one blue dot to represent all the nodes of the domain at one given layer. And the pink dot, if I want to represent all the edges of that domain at a given layer. And I'm going to use another dot to represent all the nodes of the domain at the next layer. And I'm going to use some type of arrow to indicate in that case that nodes are sending messages to nodes from the layer T to the layer T plus one. So that's going to be one single pictogram that represents how information travels here only between nodes from one layer to the next. So let me introduce the pictograms that are going to describe the message passing schemes. So first, the researcher needs to choose which cells will send messages to which cells and via which neighboring structures. So for example, here, one example of message passing scheme could be to decide that only nodes are going to send messages to nodes and that's it. And the neighboring structure they're gonna use is the upper adjacency matrix so by going through the edges. But we could have other designs. We could design a message passing scheme where edges send information to edges to the lower adjacency. And same thing to send messages between cells of different rank. Second, the researcher needs to choose the type of message passing. And we have three choices that are common in the literature, either a convolutional message passing or an attentional message passing or general message passing. And these are three choices that are known from graph neural network. For these three choices, we're gonna use three different pictograms. So let's say I have edges that send information to edges from one layer to the next. If the message passing is convolutional, I'm gonna use that black arrow. If the message passing is attentional, I'm gonna use a orange arrow. And if the message passing is general, I'm gonna use an arrow with a larger width. Note that we can have an, atten an attentional mechanism even for a message passing that is not convolutional, that is, that is general. I'm gonna show you equations of what a convolutional message passing looks like. Here it is. So for example, this pictogram here, what does it mean? It means that at layer T, the edges Y send messages to edges uh, X's that share a boundary with it. And it's a convolutional uh, message passing, which means that the message has this equation. There is a message going from cell X, cell Y to cell X, that are both of rank one, that goes through this neighboring matrix, more or less zeros and ones, I mean, has some zeros. This is the feature of Y at layer T, and this theta here means the learnable parameters. So to each of these pictogram corresponds some type of equation, the simplest of which being the convolutional type. If you have a more complicated type of message passing, just imagine that this equation is a bit more complicated. All right, so that's define the message. 
the next choice that the researcher need to make is to how we're going to incorporate uh, features coming from different cells. So maybe there are many different edges that send information to that one edge X. How do I aggregate this information? If the aggregation is done with a sum, we're going to use a black arrow. If it's more complicated than the sum, we're going to use this little uh, banana here. And third, if we have different neighborhoods that send information to the same cell, so for example, X is receiving X is an edge is receiving messages from other edges, but also receiving messages from nodes, then we need to know how we're going to aggregate this information across, so inter neighborhood. And here, same strategy. If the aggregation function is a sum, we're going to use just these arrows. And if it's more complicated than the sum, in our literature review, we're going to use this banana. And lastly, when this cell X gets all of this information with different neighborhoods, each neighborhood having different cells, that cell needs to update its feature because this is the whole point of the message passing scheme is for the cell to update its feature at layer T plus one. And we're going to have two pictograms. Either it's only using an update function, for example, a sigmoid, or it's a, using an update function that takes into account the feature it had at the previous layer. In that case, we'll have a circular arrow. Let's see one example of this graphical framework. So in the literature review, you're going to see pictograms like this. This is a simpli simplified version of a topological neural network published by Bodnar and co others in 2021. So what does it mean? We see, so bottom level is layer T. Up level is layer T plus one. And these arrows represent the message passing scheme. So we see that in this neural network, we have nodes that send information to edges. We have edges that send information to edges, and we have faces that send information to faces. For each of this message passing scheme, we have different neighboring structures that are used that specify which nodes can send information to which edges. Here, these are the nodes that are in the co-boundary of the edges. Which edges can send information to the edges, etc. We see that each arrow is just an arrow. So it means that in terms of the aggregation per neighborhood, it's only a sum. And then the aggregation across neighborhood is also only a sum. And that these are the sums that you can see here. Red is the message passing, it's convolutional. Orange is the aggregation for each of the four neighborhood, actually. You have three equations because I needed space. So the two uh, Laplacians are here. Green is the aggregation across neighborhoods. It's a sum. Yeah, indeed, we only see arrows. And blue is the update function. All right, so now that we have our graphical framework, let's use it to review this literature. And let me restate our goal. The goal is to provide or to use this intuitive framework, so this pictograms notion, to elucidate the topological domain and the deep learning mechanisms that exist in the literature on topological neural network. We're going to fill this table together to give a graphical summary of what has been done in topological deep learning. The topological domains are going to be the rows of this figure. So we're going to have neural network that operate on hypergraphs, on simplicial complex, cellular complex, and combinatorial, combinatorial complex. And the topology, the deep learning mechanisms are going to be the columns of this table. Where on the left, we have the standard convolutional neural network. And on the right, we have more complicated things. Attentional convolutional or a general message passing scheme. You can think of more complicated equations than the one I had showed you. And we're going to see how these topological neural networks generalize the graph neural networks indeed, because a graph neural network, a graph convolutional neural network, would be represented by this pictogram. Nodes send information to nodes from the layer T to the layer T plus one through the adjacency matrix, so through edges. And you're going to see that the pictograms of this table will be indeed more complicated than the graph convolutional network uh, pictogram. Okay, so let's start with 
topological neural networks that operate on the hypergraph domain. The hypergraph domain is one of the oldest domain on which topological deep learning has been employed. Before hypergraph neural networks, the strategy to do deep learning on hypergraph was to take the hypergraph, collapse it into a graph, and then use graph neural networks. However, this was losing important structural information. And so the first neural network to really include the hypergraph st structure was the one uh, published here in 2020. And you can see that it in introduced this idea of having nodes sending information to edges and then back to nodes. So blue, pink, blue, that has been used in hypergraph neural networks afterwards, because you can see that a lot of the other neural networks have this employ this strategy as well. I'd like to point out uh, this neural network here, published in 2021, because it is one that deals with the problem of over smoothing. Over smoothing is a problem encountered in graph neural networks, and maybe unsurprisingly, it applies to topological neural networks. And in this paper, the others have employed strategies from graph neural network literature to tackle this problem for the hypergraph neural network. I'd like to point out this one here too. You can recognize the red arrows that denotes attention mechanisms. So this is an example of how successful models from the graph neural network literature have been applied to topological deep learning. Here is the application of transformers to the hypergraph domain. Moving on to the simplicial uh, domain, so simplicial neural network. First, we have this neural network that looks very much like a graph neural network, because you can see that nodes send information to nodes only. Edges send information to edge only. And faces in dark pink send information to faces only. A model that had been generalized to cells with any dimension. So here we use the color yellow to say any cell can send a message to cells of the same rank in the generalization of graph neural networks. It's only a bit later that Bunch introduced this simplicial complex neural network where information is allowed to travel across cells of different ranks. So we can see, for example, the nodes send information to edges, but also to nodes. And we have this cross, uh, these crosses that indicate information going across cells of different ranks. Things can get more complicated as we add different levels in these message passing schemes. I'd like to point out this neural network, which uses an attention mechanism, which you can recognize through this uh, red arrow. It's also the only topological neural network that is heterogeneous in the sense that it can deal with features of different dimensions defined on its node edges and faces. In the cellular domain, we have less topological neural networks, way less. Uh, and we can also observe that the architectures that have been proposed here really mimic what, have been what has been done in the simplicial case. So we can see that the neural network at the bottom looks very much like the corresponding simplicial neural network just above it. Similar strategy, again, is used for these two neural networks. And even in the intentional case, again, denoted by the red arrow, we can see that the only attentional com cellular complex neural network employs a similar strategy as its counterpart from the simplicial complex uh, deep learning world. And lastly, in the combinatorial domain, there is only one paper that has proposed three different topological neural networks. And so it's an exciting area of research to determine how much this new domain can bring to the to the field. In terms of expressiveness, the more flexible the domain, the more expressive it is in a sense defined by the geometric learning literature. And in terms of performance, what do we get? So in this table, again, the rows represent the domains and the column represent different machine learning tasks that these domains have been trained on. Node level classification, Will Alice, a node of the social network, engage with this content? 
at the edge level or complex level machine learning task. We can use, we can look at the level of benchmarking that has been performed for each of these models. And you can see that almost half of it, of them, have been compared to graph neural network. This is what is shown in green. In that context, we say that we see that most of these more flexible domain have been shown to outperform the graph neural networks in terms of prediction accuracy, for example, classification accuracy. However, they are not always compared to the graph neural network in terms of complexity and time it takes to process information. And maybe more importantly, they are not always compared to other topological neural networks. So let's say another is proposing a new hypergraph neural network. Most of the time that hypergraph neural network is benchmarked against a graph neural network, sometimes to another hypergraph neural network, but almost uh, never to, let's say, a serial complex neural network. So it's difficult to compare across domains. And so what are the open questions in the field? Well, I think we do need more benchmark data sets and interesting benchmark data sets, which actually have high order relationships, not just a graph that I have transformed into a simplicial complex just because I wanted to test my simplicial complex neural network. And also these models would need to always include a measure of complexity, not only show the performance in terms of accuracy, but how long did it really take to train that model? We would like to see more models that address outstanding problems from the graph neural network communities and problems that are known to be forwarded to the topological deep learning communities, such as oversmoothing and overquashing. More dynamic topological neural network will be interesting, where dynamic topological neural network means a neural network where the domain can change from one layer to the next. It doesn't have to be one graph from one layer to the next. And lastly, maybe generalizing to irregular complexes, which are illustrated here. We propose to address these questions together. So with the fantastic organizers here, we are organizing a topological deep learning challenge at ICML 2023 in the ICML edition of this workshop, where the goal is to implement topological neural networks that are reviewed in the table I just showed you so that we have it them in one shared code base and we can actually benchmark them. And to make that task easier, we have rewritten all the equations that have led to the graphical literature review that I just showed you using the same notation in a GitHub repository called Awesome TNNs to make it easier on the participant of the challenge to actually implement this model. In conclusion, I hope I've given you an introduction to topological neural networks, introduce a graphical framework to help us think about what are the different key components of such neural network. And we've used this graphical framework to survey the literature by completing this table. Thank you very much for your attention. I have some questions, but uh, let's see if anybody else has it first. I don't think during the the layers so for example you start with some so by representation you mean the type of domain for example what do you mean by representation Yes, yes. So here it's the same across the layers. That's what we call the static uh, topological neural network. But you can have dynamic 
topological neural network that would change the representation from layer to layer. So you could have something that has a different number of nodes here and other layers, and maybe something different here. In that case, we call it dynamic. I don't, oh, there, I remember seeing one paper that does uh, that type of uh, dy dynamism and basically from one layer to the next, a clustering mechanism is applied so that you get a coarser and coarser domain or representation as you go through the layers. I think they do it automatically with some notion of K nearest neighbors. Um, and that would be the equivalent of the pooling that you see, like argmax or average pooling that you see in um, convolutional neural networks on images where you reduce the size of the image from one layer to the next if you use uh, max or average pooling there. Yeah. But indeed, uh, I remember seeing one, maybe a few more, but definitely not that many dynamic topological neural networks that are not graph neural networks. Yeah, thank you. So in sort of, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, I, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. So you, you mentioned um, like a couple of times this trade-off between expressiveness and complexity. Um, how, like, how do people go about formalizing this trade -off? Yes. Um, I mean, you can, in terms of the complexity, you can actually just compute the number of uh, elementary operations, which is not. Um, and then how do people go about balancing this trade-off? Well, something that saves topological neural networks is uh, a natural problem, which is oversmoothing. So it is oversmoothing is a problem that is encountered in graph neural network, which is the tendency of the features as they are updated from layers to layers to have no information whatsoever because all the features of the new of the components of the domain are going to converge to the same thing. And for this reason, so that happens in graph neural networks, that happens even more in topological neural networks because nodes and edges and faces and more components are talking together. And for this reason, very often we have very shallow neural networks. So two layers, three layers, etc. And so to some extent that saves the day because you only have three layers. So the complexity is not that bad. And the hope is that since you can send information faster, so from one node to the other, you don't have to go through all of the edges that connect them. You can go through the faces and it goes faster. The hope is that with less layers, even though the computation of one layer is going to be more expensive, with less layers, you're going to be able to achieve the same goal. Um, in terms of how they, so that's how they address the complexity problem. In terms of how they evaluate it, uh, I don't remember seeing theorem, but I'll have to double check, but then it's a yeah, more benchmark needed to actually see what, what's happened. Great question. So my question was more just what your thoughts are on some of the big, biggest roadblocks. We've seen huge movements in generative AI, especially in the last six months and this notion of foundation models. Do you think that something like a topological foundation model could exist? or just general philosophical question. Yeah, that's a, a great, great question. Um, so I, yeah, I think topological neural network could be used to build a foundational model. So I could imagine a topological neural network being trained on the academic literature, maybe as a hypergraph neural network where nodes are academic researchers and edges are when exactly two researchers have published a paper and hyper edges three researchers, for example, when these three people have published a paper. The thing is with foundational models, though, is that they have been, I mean, they need a lot of data, or at least the ones that are very famous have been trained on a lot of data. And so that goes back to the other question, which is, is this even feasible with something whose computational complexity uh, can be exploding? So what I would think would be to first train a foundational model on a lot of data, but that's model will not be topological and maybe refine it with a topological neural network on less data. And I don't think that has been done. So yeah, that would be, would be exciting.
Well, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks, Nina. Thank you. We will be on break until 1045 for the morning coffee break. I don't know how much they're doing here in the East Wing versus in the West Wing. <laughs> so I apologize if you have to go back and forth. If you are speaking in the next uh, window uh, between 1045 and leading up to lunch, our first four spotlight talks, um, please stick around just for a second so we can go through the logistics for getting your slides up if you are in person.
Okay, well, welcome back everyone from the break. We're gonna have four spotlight talks during this session, and then we'll take a, a break for lunch. We have our first speaker up here right now, Anki from the Imperial College of London. I'll just switch over the display to you and then you should be able to go. Okay, cool. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Anki. I'm a final year PhD student at Imperial College London. And today I'll be presenting our work on topology preserving compositionality for robust medical image segmentation. I'll first give a brief overview of medical image segmentation. So medical image segmentation is quite unique because anatomy is consistent among patients. This means that there's very limited structural and spatial variability in the segmentation maps. However, in medical imaging, we often acquire the images on different scanners across different sites. These different scanners often have different acquisition protocols, which leads to textual shifts from one scanner type to the next. Unfortunately, in medical in deep learning, these deep learning based segmentation models are not very robust to textual shifts. So if we train on one scan type and test it on another scan type, we often get a degradation in the segmentation performance. This is particularly true for CNNs, which show textual bias. So we therefore propose a simple recipe in order to combat this. We ex basically exploit the limited structural and spatial variability in medical image segmentation. And we propose to constrain the latent space of any deep learning based segmentation model to a finite number of components to construct a dictionary. We then sample this dictionary in a topological preserving manner in order to construct the segmentation output. And the reason why we do this is because otherwise we'll be sampling this dictionary independently, which will lead to anatomically implausible segmentation outputs. The diagram on the right gives an intuition into how we want our method to work. So if we sample these two components from our dictionary and then compose them by summation, we'll get this as an output, but this does not match the label. Whereas if we sample these two components and then compose them by summation, we'll get this as the output and this does match the label. And this provides the motivation of how we're going to approach our work. So how do we preserve topology? So we use a popular area of topological data analysis called persistent homology. So we can use persistent homology to provide us with gross topological features for segmentation maps, such as the number of connected components, holes, and voids. There are two key ingredients to persistent homology. The first is the connectivity of your topological space. And in our work, as we're dealing with images, we construct what we call cubical complexes to, to, to construct our topolog topological space. The second ingredient of persistent homology is the filtration function. In our work, we use an intensity-based filtration function as we're dealing with images. We use this intensity-based filtration function to construct a number of cubical complexes at different thresholds. Now, this together forms a nested sequences of cubic, of cubic complex, where one cubic complex is a subset of the next cubic complex, and this is shown here. Now, for each cubic complex, we can calculate the d-dimensional topological features which exists, and then using this, we can calculate when a topological feature is born and dies. This essentially creates a tuple of birth and death times, which we use to fill in something called a persistence diagram. On the right, we have an example. So if you look at the bottom, we have the labels for something called the myocardial segmentation. And what you see here is that there is one connector opponent, which is born at one and dies at zero, highlighted by the red circle, and a hole, which is also born at one and dies at zero, highlighted by the blue square. Above, we have the output of a, seg a deep learning segmentation model after we apply the softmax function. And this is a continuous output from zero to one. Here you also get one connected component and a hole which is born at one and dies at zero. But we also get these topological features along the diagonal, which represents, which die instantly basically, which represents noisy topological features. And this is what you get when you're dealing with continuous outputs, essentially. 
Here, we give a brief overview of how our method works. So firstly, we wanna map our image to a continuous latent space using an encoder. We then collapse this continuous latent space to a finite number of components to construct a dictionary. And the way we do this is using vector quantization. In vector quantization, we divide our continuous latent space to a finite number of vectors. We then minimize the distance between each of the vectors in the continuous latent space with its nearest component in the dictionary. Then we replace each vector in the continuous latent space with its nearest component in the dictionary to create a discretized latent space known here as Z hat. If you look at the previously, so this is the equation above for vector quantization. And you can see this is quite similar to k-means, except here we're collapsing all the vectors. Uh, zoom slides. Okay. Sorry. So in this equation for vector quantization, you can see this is quite similar to k-means, except here we're collapsing all the vectors or points around the centroid onto the centroid. And this is what makes discretization different from clustering. Going back to this, what we do next is, once you have our discretized latent space, we want these features to be disentangled, i.e. unique. And we do this by applying a shape disentanglement loss shown here. And essentially what we do is, we minimize the dot product of all the discretized features in our latent space. What this leads to is it leads to our features only representing shape. Because this is because these discretized, these discretized features are, are calculated after a softmax function. So essentially, what, this, what you do is what you're finding is that if you sum over all of these features, it will equal to one. Whereas, and if you do the dot product of all these features, given this loss function, it will equal zero. This therefore means each discrete feature can only be binary and hence only represent shape and therefore texture is removed. Going back to this, what we do now is we construct our low dimensional class segmentation outputs shown here by summing over the discretized features. We then wanna minimize the topological loss between these low dimensional class segmentation outputs and the low dimensional labels. And the way we do this is by this P Wasserstein distance loss, which minimizes the Wasserstein distance loss between the persistence diagrams for the low dimensional class segmentation output and the persistence diagrams for the low dimensional labels. We also wanna apply our method in a hierarchical manner. And we do this by summing over the low dimensional class segmentation outputs to create low dimensional foreground, foreground segmentation output shown here. And again, we minimize the topological loss between our low dimensional foreground segmentation output and our low dimensional label. We apply our method in a deeply supervised method, a manner at each level of the decoder until we get to the final segmentation outputs. We then carry out a number of experiments to show the benefit of topological preserving propositionality, which we abbreviate to TPC. In our first set of experiments, we evaluate segmentation performance under a number of perturbations in the input space. We, we applied various perturbations. For example, in the first set of perturbations, we applied noise-based based perturbations such as textual changes, such as Gaussian noise, Poisson noise, and salt and pepper noise. We apply spatial perturbations in the form of Gaussian blur and motion artifact. We also apply contrast and intensity-based perturbations. And we incorporate TPC into three different types of models, UNET, NN UNET, and SWINNET unit, SWINNET unit R. And what you see on the, in the table on the right, we see that by, inc by incorporating TPC, there's far less degradation in the segmentation performance under the various perturbations compared to not incorporating TPC. We can visualize this with an example below, whereby incorporating TC TPC produces segmentation maps which are much more anatomically meaningful. And you can also see that the number of connected components better matches the label. So essentially our method is essentially ignoring the perturbations and it's also kind of acting as a counting loss function, which is useful for um, when we have a, a lot of labels in the output space, essentially. We then evaluate our method in the single domain generalization setting. And in, th in this setting, essentially what we wanna do is we train on one domain 
and test it on a completely different domain. We evaluate our method on two different types of data sets, the Kardec and the Prosta MRI data sets, where there's a large acquisition shift, where there's a different scanner type and different acquisition protocols. We also compare our method to different SDG methods. We compare it to two augmentation-based methods, uh, big org and cutout. We also compare it to advbias, which is an adversarial data augmentation method specific to MRI. We then also compare it to RANCOM, which is basically applies randomized convolutional layers to remove texture information. And we finally compare it to JIGEN, which is a self-supervised method which solves jigsaw puzzles. Our baseline model is a, a unit, basically. And you can see here, our method outperforms the majority of the SDG methods and competes favorably with the best one, which is Big Org. And in the diagram below, you can see our method also, again, produce segmentation maps, which are more anatomically meaningful. We then carry out an ablation to evaluate each component of our method. We evaluate this method in the single domain generalization setting. And again, we compare it to cardiac and prostate MRI. We also evaluate on cardiac and prostate MRI data sets. And you can see that by incorporating each component of our method, the dictionary, followed by the class topological loss, followed by the foreground topological loss, the segmentation incrementally improves. And this holds true for both the dice score and the Betty error and shows that each component of our method is important in order to improve the robustness of segmentation models. In conclusion, we, we exploit the, the limited structural and spatial variability in medical image segmentation and propose a method called topological preserving compositionality. We show that our method improves the robustness of various segmentation models under both perturbation, various perturbations and domain shifts. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Do we have any questions? So I apologize if I missed it, but when you were talking about using the P watch switching distance in there between persistence diagrams, you were operating directly on the persistence diagrams, or have you thought about if you could get increased efficiency by integrating some of the generative type models where people try to synthesize what the persistence diagram would look like or those distances. No, it's just directly on the exactly. on the on the class maps the Did that pose any sort of computational models? It, it, it does. It? it does because um one of the advantages here is that these are low dimensional so they're quite small, but we're playing in a deeply supervised manner. So you're playing at, at each level and then when you go to higher out dimensional outputs, it does slow it down by quite, uh, quite a bit. And are you doing any, is there any necessary like pre-processing of your images on the front side yeah. to make sure that the pipeline works? Yeah, so we have to normalize our images between zero and one. We're dealing with MRI data, which is very heterogeneous. So everything has to follow a very strict pipeline in order to make this method work, essentially. Any other questions? And I'm curious, have you been working with and any folks in the medical industry to understand like the different types of errors and how to like, give an optimal result back to, to them as doctors? Uh, no, no, not yet. Okay, uh, so hopefully eventually, yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you again. So we'll give our next, thank you much. Our next speaker will be live, but it's virtual. So we're gonna go get them set up on the computer. We'll do a quick sound check and make sure Tim, is that you'll want to unmute your computer, right? We are unmuted. Uh, if our next speaker would like to share her slides. Uh, it says you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Okay. Can, uh, Dijing, can you do a, a mic check for us? Uh, no, yes. Uh, okay. Oh, from here. Can you share? Not be able to record the content. Quit. Open. Okay. It seems some like issue here. Uh. Um. Well. Okay. Um, okay. Do I think I send my slides to you. Yep, I was going to say I will get them shared on my end. You'll just need to tell me when you'd like them to advance. Does that sound good? Yeah, I think I can share. Let me try. Can you see my screen? Yeah. 
yes, we're we're good now. Okay, great. Thank you. My name is Ya Jing Liu. I'm a research scientist from Colorado State University, and I'm going to present our work on high mean similarity and graph Laplacians for class partitioning and the adversary image detection. So the first slide talk about the background and what do we do in this paper. So we consider neural networks with ReLU activations. So for any uh, given data input, so we consider a pre-trained neural network. So given a data point, so we only consider the um, hidden layers with ReLU activations. So we, we define bit vectors, which is which are vectors of like one or zeros, de determined by the ReLU activation patterns. And we use the ReLU activation patterns, um, also called like a bit vector, to understand and interpret how the neural networks work. So first, we build a representational dissimilarity matrices based on the bit vectors at each hidden layer with ReLU activations to investigate the whole coherence of data within the embedding spaces of a deep neural network. And then we apply feeder partitioning method on the Laplace matrix constructed from the bit vector measures of similarity to classify images and detect adversary images. Finally, we also build a linear SVM classifier using the input of bit vectors in the last red layer to detect adversary images. This last gives some like uh, uh, definitions we will use for the presentation. First is the bit vector. So I said we consider a pre-trained neural network with ReLU activation. So at each hidden layer with ReLU activation, so for a given data input, so we define a bit vector, which is a vector of one or zeros, and which has a length um, equal to the number of hidden nodes in that layer. And if uh, the bit vector assigns one to nodes that active the ReLU uh, at the um, input point, uh, zero otherwise. We also use uh, RDM, which is short for representational dissimilarity matrix. And that is, uh, okay, uh, we, for building the RDM, so we have to consider like input data set. So given um, an input data set, so at each hidden layer, we calculate its output. Then we build the RDM using the, uh, the RDM is a square matrix. Um, and each entry denoting the dissimilarity between the corresponding like output. And the dissimilarity metric can be, you know, can be like a, a high mean distance, like cosine distance and all other distance. And the data set and the model we can see here, here in this let's talk about. The data set we use is ImageNet 1K data set, which has 1,000 classes. And in the training data set, each class has 1,300 images. In the validation data set, each class has 50 images. And in the test data set, each class has 100 images. We uh, created the uh, adversary images mainly uh, using the, based on the validation data set. And also we downloaded uh, damage net, uh, which was created by other researchers, um, also based on validation data set. So we created uh, like uh, another uh, three classes of adversary images using the um, existing like uh, method FGSM, PGD, and also CW. The more pre the model we consider is ResNet 50. And it was in, introduced in 2015. The, uh, the key point of this uh, neural network is it allow, uh, it uses skip connections to allow the neural network to skip some like uh, layers. They can use, uh, it can, the input of some initial, some earlier layer can be directly used as the, uh, in, uh, the output of some early, early layer. Earlier layer can be used as input of some like later layers. It can skip some uh, some layers to avoid the diminishing gradients, or vanishing gradients problem. Uh, okay, this is let's talk about how we uh, calculate the RDM. So I said we consider a pre trained ResNet 50. Actually, it has like 50 layers, but it only has 17 layers, has ReLU uh, activations. So we only consider the, the bare products of that 17 ReLU layers. Um, we use high mean distance because we, for each for the each hidden layer for any given data point we define a bit vector of one of re, uh, zeros and for any two data points we calculate the high mean distance it's just that the number of entries uh, you know one or zero different corresponding 
um, entries, different corresponding entries. Um, the punchline of our method is that, you know, because for the 17 layers, um, the first layer, remember, it has 800K uh, nodes, and the total, the number, the number of total nodes for the 70 layers is 6.3 million. But for each hidden layer, we only extract 1,000 significant uh, features or uh, significant bits using some like, uh, uh, we use select key best method from a second layer. And also we, we, we have training, we, we use training data to select the significant features. And then we use the select the significant features to, uh, to uh, get the um, cutted or shortened like a B vector for the test data. And then we calculate the RDM on the test data. And we investigate how the RDM evolves through the 17 red layers to explain how the neural network works layer by layer. And this is uh, um, our uh, simulation result. Here we have, because we have 1,000 classes for the, the, the entire data set, but we only look at two data set, two classes here. One is tench, one, um, it's also, uh, one, one, it's one class of fish, and then another is a snake. Because this is based on the, uh, this is based on the, we use the validation data set uh, uh, for test. So each like, class has 50 images. So when we build the RDM, we have the X axis and the Y axis both have like 100 entries because the first the 50 is from Tenj and the second is from uh, Sender Snake. And the bar values we can hear because this is this, this similarity. So the smaller the value, that means they are more similar. From the first like uh, four or uh, um, figures we can see the first of all like layer uh, red layers we can see um, all uh, data points or, or images from the two classes exhibit like a similarity that means the neural network try to find the similarity even among point, um, images from different classes and then as the layer goes deeper and the neural network starts to recognize the difference between the first class and the second class is off diagonal entries so it's become more redder and uh, also at some layers, uh, for example, the uh, five, uh, five and six, it, it, it start to recognize more uh, similarity in the second uh, class. And as the layer goes deeper and deeper, the neural network will try to like uh, find more like the similarity between the two classes and the more similarity in the same class. And at the last three layers, we can see the neural network, neural network like, uh, you know, um, can separate the two classes very well. And then we use a, a, like a, a algebraic like a method called the federal vector partitioning to do also do the classification or partition. So it's a, um, this method is kind of is we consider like a graph. Okay, and actually at each data point we consider as a vertex of like a graph, and we try to like classify the the, the nodes on the graph to like subclasses. So we build a um, weighted adjacency matrix A, and then we can calculate the degree matrix and the Laplace matrix. And the Fiddler vector is a, a, a V2 here, eigenvector corresponding to the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplace matrix. And the Laplace matrix, how we build that, we, because uh, adjacency matrix, we, we build that using the uh, one minus like the uh, uh, Hamming distance matrix because it's uh, the similarity. Mm, for the vector partitioning, so how that works, once we get the uh, Laplace matrix and we get the eigenvector of the corresponding to the second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplace matrix, we only look at the sum of V2. For example, for that uh, 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 simulation I just showed, we have like 100 images. So we have V2 should have 100 entries. And we look at the set of the 100 uh, like uh, image uh, entries and the uh, index corresponding to V2 uh, greater than zero, we classify as one class and less than zero to another class. And uh, for those vertices that corresponding to the vector equal to zero can be cl uh, classified into either class. Actually, we don't have any like uh, um, index corresponding to the uh, vector, uh, eigenvector equal to zero. So I said we build the 
uh, adjacent matrix using one minus the Hamming um, H, H, H matrix is a distant matrix. So it's built, constructed using the Hamming distance. And we still, we do the same thing. We also utilize the feature selection to identify most crucial bits using a training data set. And then, then for test data set, we use the selected like features to calculate the Hamming distance matrix and then the adjacency matrix. And finally, we got the Laplace matrix. And then we apply feature repartition to Laplace matrix to construct it on the test data set. And here is our results. The, the, in the table here, we have a layer number. We have 17 layers because we do have uh, every hidden layer. And the second row is the accuracy, the total accuracy for the classification of the two classes. And the third one is for trench. And the, the last one uh, for the standard snake. And we can see the accuracy increase generally as the layer goes deeper, but it does decrease from layer seven to eight. But if you look at the trench and the standard snake, we can see from layer seven to eight, the neural network, you know, try to like classify standard snake, um, you know, very well from 84 to 100. But for trench, it, it, it dropped a lot. So at some layer, neural network try to find the, the similarity uh, for one class, but not for a, or another one. But the in but in the in general trend, it gets better and better. And in the last three layers, you can see the total accuracy is uh, one hundred percent. We also do the same similar uh, experiment on another four pairs of two classes. So we got we only plot the uh, the accurate test accuracy on like uh, ReLU 11517, and we can see the increasing like uh, uh, ac test accuracy classification accuracy. Actually, the um, federal partitioning algorithm can be used for multiple classification also. Two to n can be like a two four or uh, eight. Just look at the uh, the uh, the. Um, same patterns of the eigenvectors corresponding to the first n and then eigenvectors corresponding to the, the first uh, uh, n non-zero, the minimum non-zero like eigenvalues. And we also do two superclass classification. Two superclass means we consider like tension and the goldfish both belong to belonging to fish as what well, as fish, and also another two like a snake as snake. So we got also very good classification rate at the last three uh, layers. We also do the adversarial uh, detection because adversarial and non-adversarial also two class. We also got a very good results. I'm not going to the detail. Because we, the, finally, we, um, we build up, because we find that normally people use the pinamental layer uh, or the, the latent layer uh, like um, embedding. You know, it, uh, it includes the most information. But the reality actually is before that. Actually, we find that the, the reality layer carries also a, a significant information. That's why we want to test whether we can use just use the last reality layer as an input to detect adversarial. And because we already um, tried that, the, we build our SVM using directly on the latent layer or pinamental layer embedding. So we got good results. Now we test on the, um, the last reality um, output as the input. So we uh, still consider this data set, and but we, we because the data is bigger, so we only uh, choose like a three subsets of the data set. We have three data sets, and we compare. We use the last value layer bit vector as input to build a, a SVM classifier, and also we use the pinamental layer embeddings as input to build the SVM. We compare results. No, for the uh, because the last the pinamental layer has like a two sun uh, and forty eight uh, um, uh, dimensions. So when we do the uh, feature selection for the with the ReLU output uh, um, as input, so we do both one thousand and two sun and forty eight. So we can get we got a, a similar like a performance with the um, you, with the case for using the uh, latent layer. But when we use like one, even we use 1,000 features, we can get like a comparable results. Okay. Um, finally, I want to conclude our work. So we demonstrated that the RDMs build uh, based on the real activation patterns uh, can be used to interpret how the neural network works. And then we showcase that 1,000 out of the, uh, here is a typo, it should be like a 100K, like order magnitude nodes, carry enough information for representing the data. 
we apply the fitted partitioning on the Laplace matrix constructed from the bit vector measures of similarity to achieve like over 95% image classification accuracy. And finally, we build an SVM with input of bit vectors in the last real layer that separates adversary images from non-adversary ones with more than 95% accuracy. I think that's all, thank you. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker. I think, unfortunately, due to timing, we'll have to pass on questions. But feel free to uh, the folks in the room here put anything in the chat or contact the author directly. And next up, we have Tegan Emerson. I need her to stop sharing now. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I am presenting on behalf of excellent work done by a colleague of mine, Auden Myers, who's a postdoc um, at Pacific Northwest National Labs. Um, I will be talking about our paper on top fusion, which is really looking and starting to explore how you can leverage sort of the universality and uh, of topological features to perform multimodality fusion and what other things that might be useful for. So we have a large team here. Um, and again, just to highlight uh, Auden is a postdoc. He is the second from the right as you're looking at it. Um, and he, he did a lot of this work um, coming through it. So in terms of thinking about multimodality data fusion, um, there are sort of two umbrella ways that we think about this and how you could describe it. So feature fusion, this is where you will effectively, for each of your different modalities, when I'm saying modalities here, it means different formats of your data. So you could imagine having images and uh, text, you could imagine having images and time series, but you have two different structures, or you could also have an array of sensors all collecting the same data. So you could think about wearable technology and we'll have an application in that. But where you either extract features from each one of those separately, then you do some form of concatenation. You can also do this in a very sophisticated way, looking at different model architectures, multi-headed models, where you're essentially still concatenating those features um, in some modular way. And then you feed that into a collective decision model to make your uh, overall final decision. The other approach would be model fusion. These are also often called early and late fusion. Um, but model fusion is where you would essentially build modality specific uh, models or decision processes, and then you'd employ some form of a majority voting scheme, and what you want to do is make an informed decision. There's some things about these that are from, at least from a mathematical perspective, they don't always sit so well. You could imagine for different modalities, when you are going to just concatenate, you could have entirely different units for the different sections of your vector. You've mapped things to a very nonsensical, from a mathematical perspective, space. Um, and so how can we also leverage that? A lot of what you see um, when you're doing these as well is it doesn't really explicitly capture the relationships across modalities. You can get it to some level implicitly, uh, but you leave a lot to just sort of be inferred underneath. So what our approach was for this was topological data fusion, where here you take your different modalities, topological features, this is employing techniques from persistent homology. Um, and those are essentially things that you, there's a different way that you extract them from each modality, but you're still effectively mapping and extracting the same core features from each of those modalities. And so you're gonna go through for each of your modalities, a filtration process. You're gonna create a topological summary, which shown here is a persistence image, which is a vectorization of a persistence diagram, but there's many others as well. Then in our case, we're gonna use these persistence images to create a multi-channel image. So create a tensor that we would feed in to some neural network-based decision model so that we can then, as we convolve, for example, through those channels, we're able to compare features from one modality that's in the same feature space and look at the relationships directly between those features across the modalities. So in this work, we sort of focused it on two things. Um, <clears throat> there's two pieces here. One is how should you actually extract topological features and how do you strengthen their discriminatory power? So for example, um, images, when you think about the MNIST data set, um, a one is a five, is a seven, um, is a two? 
I think those are the right numbers there, right? They're all one connected component. They're all essentially, if you were to apply normal persistent homology through something called sublevel set filtration, you would see a single connected component, nothing too exciting. Whereas, and so you don't necessarily have the same discriminatory power that you would want to be able to harness in an ideal world. So we're gonna present um, some work that Auden did looking at one way of boosting the discriminatory power for that modality and that data set specifically. The other piece is how can you actually leverage topology when you have incomplete data? So this is a problem that we face a lot in the spaces that we work in, where you could imagine if you have an array of sensors, one of those sensors goes out. What can you still do in that particular setting? And does this fact that you've mapped into a common feature space give you anything in your ability to better make inference in the presence of incompletely measured data? Um, so, uh, I think these videos are playing. Um, so for the how do we strengthen, this is that example with the MNIST, the images, how do we actually strengthen the discriminatory power? This is a method that Auden developed that instead of doing sub-level set filtration, which is going to look at the different intensity levels in an image and go through them and you look at connected components and neighbors and build a simplicial complex based off of that, um, he looked at how could we leverage zigzag persistence, um, which is a way of handling abstract simplicial complexes where you don't have um, a direct inclusion role. So where one always has to be included in the other, you can use um, unions and intersections as a way of connecting these when there is not an, a, a natural inclusion direction rule. Um, and so here, what he's doing is he's actually showing, so here you have the little loop it looks like it has stalled out on me. It's probably because it's a very big GIF. So um, I will let them go. But this is just showing how you actually are creating um, the zigzag. I won't get lost in the details for this one here. I'm happy to follow up with anyone about it. But it does, we find, give us a much stronger discriminatory power in images. Um, and it scales substantially better with the number of pixels, um, which is also important for a lot of the applications we're not showcasing in this work. Um, so then the second piece of the problem that I mentioned is this notion of data completion and imputation for early fusion. So what we assume is that in your training scenario, you have this uh, situation on the left where you have modalities you can extract, you have a complete data set that you're training on. And so you already have the ability to extract your features and then feed them into your decision model. What we actually imagine in a lot of our operational scenarios is that you might have data modality one and you can extract the features there, but what happens if you're missing the other one? And so the first option would be to actually try to complete the missing data directly, try to approximate what you think that specific raw data should have looked like, and then extract features from that and feed it through. Um, the other way is to try to complete the features directly. So can we actually infer what the features should look like in the based off of nearest neighbors and other methodologies? Um, and so in... Uh, what we think when again when we're talking about the original ways that people typically think about this for option two um it's really hard to imagine how you what you would effectively be needing to do is figure out how do you define a relationship between one set of features and another set of features that's made more complex by the fact that you also would have to include effectively unit conversions for things that maybe don't make sense depending on how you're actually constructing those features so there's our hypothesis is that that's actually a bit more difficult in the case where you're not having this existing universal space that you're leveraging. Um, so what we did is we looked at two different data sets. This first one, it's called uh, WESAT. It's the Wearable Stress Affect Detection data set. This ultimately has a downstream classification task attached to it, where you have um, different wearable technologies attached to somebody. They're collecting measurements that are in, supposed to be indicative of what their current stress level is. Um, and then what you want to be able to predict is whether they're, they're stressed, amused, or just they're in their baseline state. And so what we do here is for each of those time series, we've developed a filtration pipeline. I won't go into the details, but it leverages uh, time delayed embeddings um, to create, uh, extract topological features from that data. Um, and then what we wanna know is what happens in this case, they have one that is attached to your chest and one that's attached to your wrist. What happens if one of those goes out? And so what we did is we created our actual baselines here. So the baselines are on the left. So this is a PIs here stands for persistence images. And so this is if you are just trying to build up this three class classifier based off of the topological features um, using only one modality. 
And so here, the first thing to notice is that if you look at wrist PIs, chest PIs, and then the third one that says wrist and chest, you are actually able to get a performance gain by performing the topological fusion. Um, and then if you actually implement based off of one of the existing papers, we're able to outperform the other statistically based approaches that people use here. We are working on comparing these to more conventional uh, state of the art deep learning architectures as well. And so on the right is what happens if you actually now, okay, what we have are the risk PIs. And what we're going to do is assume that for those test subjects, we don't have their chest measurements, but we're going to use a nearest neighbor based imputation strategy to approximate what we think the persistence image should look like. And then we're going to feed that through and see what our overall accuracy is. And so here, what you really actually wanna be comparing this to is that 84.3 that says wrist and chest PIs together. And so there is a performance degradation when you leave out one of the modalities, but when you compare it to the comparable de degradation um, using a statistically based method, we actually are able to outperform in that setting. So we also looked at this for, um, again, uh, a different data set here. We have two separate uh, or disparate modalities. So this is where we have images and audio. Um, and so again, what we wanna do is set up, we've developed the pipeline that is motivated in the paper. Um, and so I won't go into that right now, but we do have again, a classification task um, coming out of this. Um, and then we see very similar uh, results being carried through here as well. Um, instead of reading those to you. So yeah, uh, this was really sort of our initial step and in our initial foray into this space to try to understand, is there a benefit? Um, there were lots of additional research questions that came out of this, um, but we did find that you could effectively leverage a topological feature space for these tasks in multimodality fusion. Um, and while we do have, as is the case, and one of the deterrents in a lot of settings for TDA, um, scalability does remain a challenge, but there are now approaches in software. And if we start to think more abstractly about the problem, we may be able to find ways um, to create more efficient filtrations um, like that of using zigzag persistence on images, which had not previously been done before. Um, so with that, I think I will just try to get us a little bit ahead of schedule to switch because our last one of this session is also online. So I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so the parameters for uh, uh, for the most specifications tend to be connected to the dominant and size of the scales. So if your different modalities operate in units that produce vastly different scales, is there a widening step in the process, or how are we doing the normalization? Yes, um, I think that's a, a great point. So for the uh, the applications that we considered here, I will need to double check Auden's implementation, but I believe what we did was we normalized the data on the front side um, so that we have everything on effectively the same scale for the persistence images so that you do have the same overall range. We're doing normalization in that space so that you have the same viable minimums and maximums for your birth and death scales. But I think it's an important question, and it, it is still one that's open around persistence images in general, is what is the right normalization? Should it happen on the data side? Should it happen after you've extracted persistence? Um, and how does that affect your downstream performance? Much wider and then persistent image. Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Do you have any other questions? So I, I don't know the zigzag. I just want to set that up. But it sounds like you're basically trying to take some sort of shortcut filtration. And is that at all tailored to different data modalities in particular, like strategies for different data? Yes. Um, and so in ours, we actually do it from multiple directions as well. There's been for images in particular, looking at how do you optimally use like persistent homology within the context of image classification when there's, you know, it's something that so many state-of-the-art deep learning models do much better on, generally speaking. And so, yes, there is some degree of tailoring what we are working on that is not in this paper, um, but we are working on a, a roadmap for how should you actually make the decisions about what filtration. So, for example, when you have time series data as well, you always have the option, you could do a time delayed embedding. When is it reasonable that there's an underlying dynamical system so that assumption is viable? Or when do you do sub-level set on uh, the, or the lower star rather on the 
um, time series directly and all those variations. And so it's not, there is some stuff under the rug there in terms of how are we actually making those choices. Well, let us thank our speaker one more time. And Francesco, if you're online, do you want to share your slides and do a mic check? Hello. Yes, let me share my slides. Perfect. Your volume's coming through well. And okay, can you guys see the slides and not the notes? Yep, we see the, the slides. So okay, I'll, perfect. I'll see you be taken away. Awesome. All right. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Francisco Acosta. I'm a PhD student at the Bioshape Lab at UC Santa Barbara. And I'm going to talk about my project on quantifying extrinsic curvature um, in neural manifolds. This is work done with Sophia Sanborn, Kandao Duk, Manu Madhav, and my PI, Nina Milan. So I'll start by introducing the idea of uh, neural representations. Uh, so the brain needs to represent information about the world for decision-making, problem-solving, planning for the future. And in order to do so, um, it needs to have some kind of coding scheme or a neural code to store information in the patterns of activity of neurons. Um, so the kind of neural code that we're going to consider here is called rate coding. So if you look at an individual neuron um, and you stick an electrode near that neuron, you can record its electrical activity or its voltage through time. And you will see these events called action potentials where the voltage spikes um, on a time scale of about one millisecond. These are called um, action potentials or spikes. And you can record uh, the voltage from multiple neurons at the same time. Here we have three neurons, for example, and we keep track of these spikes. So these are the individual blue lines. The idea of rate coding is that information is encoded in the rate at which these neurons are firing uh, or spiking. And we're going to compute the rates by time binning um, our spiking data uh, into time bins of uh, duration delta t. So we do that for the entire data set. And uh, we can compute the rate at which neuron i is firing at time t as the number of spikes of that neuron at time t divided by the duration uh, of the time bin. And so this gives us a number that is uh, in units of spikes per second. And if we have a population or a circuit of n neurons, we can organize that into a vector um, that is in n-dimensional space where each coordinate is the activity of a single neuron. So this is how we build um, this space that's called the neural state space. So this is a space where each coordinate axis corresponds to the activity of a given neuron. And here, every orange point in this neural state space represents a particular environmental state. Um, so at a time t0, we have a particular neural response, which corresponds to a point in this vector space. And as we vary time, as we vary the incoming stimulus, and the animal explores all the environmental states, we get a collection of points in this neural state space. And this collection of points we're going to call the neural representation for this task. And uh, the neural manifold hypothesis is the idea that in many cases, the dynamics of the circuit is constrained to a much lower dimensional manifold within the high dimensional neural state space. So here, for example, we're recording from uh, arbitrarily large population of N neurons, um, but we're depicting uh, the neural representation as being a one dimensional manifold, a ring in this space. So this is the neural representation, which I'm gonna call neural manifold in general. And so we have these abstract objects and these manifolds in neural state space and these neural manifolds represent important information about the world that our brains use to solve problems. We wanna study the mathematical structure of these neural manifolds. So one uh, set of tools that's been employed successfully is topological data analysis, like persistent homology, um, to study the number of holes in, uh, in point cloud data recorded from populations of neurons. So this has been applied, for example, to um, a head direction circuit which is a population of neurons that stores information about 2D orientation in space. So it encodes the angle at which your head is pointing in relative to some reference direction. And people found um, the underlying one dimensional ring um, in this high dimensional neural state space using uh, persistent homology. 
Similarly, um, for grid cells, which are a type of neuron that are involved in navigation and keeping representation of physical space. Um, by the way, if you're a mathematician or a physicist, you will find grid cells really fascinating. And um, their theory predicts that their collective activity uh, should lie on a torus. And recently, people used um, TDA to uncover the underlying two torus structure in the, the neural state space for the grid cell circuit. So these are all great. Um, and what we want to ask here is, uh, can we have a slightly more detailed geometric description of these manifolds? And we're going to work within the framework of Riemannian geometry. So Riemannian manifold um, Z, we're going to call it Z, um, is a manifold where uh, at every point there's a tangent space and we have a Riemannian metric, which is a function that assigns to every point an inner product. Uh, so it takes two vectors in these tangent spaces, returns a real number. Roughly speaking, uh, when you have a, a metric, um, distances and areas involve taking integrals of the metric, and things like curvature involve taking derivatives of the metric. And uh, once we have a manifold with this metric, that's called a Riemannian manifold. For curvature, which is the geometric feature that we're really interested in here, um, there's two main types of curvature. So there's intrinsic curvature, um, so you can compute that making no reference to any kind of higher dimensional embedding space. So here we have things like the Christoffel symbols and the Riemann curvature tensor, which you can then contract to get Ricci curvature tensor and Ricci scalar. So these are all notions of intrinsic curvature, which is uh, the curvature that uh, is behind, uh, for example, in general relativity that explains the, the curvature of space time explaining gravitation. We're going to be interested in extrinsic curvature, which does make a reference to a higher dimensional embedding space. This is probably the more familiar notion of curvature. Um, and we're interested in how this neural manifold curves within the embedding space, within the neural state space. Um, so how do we go about that? What can we give a metric to this neural manifold? And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna use a tool called the pullback metric. So we're going to model the neural data that we have here as a point cloud manifold due to the manifold hypothesis in the neural state space X with underlying manifold structure M. So M is a sub-manifold within X. And we're going to say that the points in this manifold M are generated by a function F that is parametrized by these latent variables Z. And we're going to add Gaussian noise to get the, the, the points in the neural state space X. And so now we have a generative model, this function that takes us from some latent space Z to the neural state space X, where the neural manifold now is the image of Z under this function F. So if we have this function from Z to X, uh, the differential of this function, which is a generalization of the first derivative or the Jacobian, is this map that takes you from the tangent space on a, uh, of a point uh, in Z to the corresponding tangent space uh, in X. And so if this function is injective, then F, the function F is called an immersion. And if X is a Riemannian manifold and this function that takes you to X is an immersion, then we can define a Riemannian metric on Z via the pullback. So what you're doing is you're pulling back the geometric structure on X uh, via this function F onto the manifold Z here. Um, so essentially you're computing inner products in Z by first using the differential map to send them to X, compute the inner product there using the metric for X, and then identify that as the inner product um, of the two vectors in the tangent space of Z. So if we have this uh, function from Z to X um, and the metric on X, we can define a metric on Z. And uh, if we have a metric, we have everything we need about the, about the geometry. And so we can compute a notion of extrinsic curvature. Uh, the particular notion that we're interested in is called mean curvature. And so uh, the mean curvature is given by taking the trace of uh, the second derivative of, the, of this uh, function F, um, the embedding here. Um, 
And if you just write that out, so the, the gammas here are the Christoffel symbols, the gammas with the twiddle on top are the Christoffel symbols for the neural state space, um, so X. And we're using Einstein notation here, so all the repeated indices are summed over. And because the embedding space X is Euclidean, the Christoffel symbols, uh, so the gammas with the twiddles are actually zero, so this ex expression simplifies a little bit. So this is how you would compute once you have this pullback metric. Um, and using that function, how you would compute something like the curvature on this latent manifold that we're using here. Okay, so moving on, how do we actually learn the geometry? Um, how do we employ deep learning um, for this use case? So this is the kind of architecture that we are proposing. Uh, what we have here is that we have a collection of points. We have our neural representation in neural state space. We're going to pass that through an encoder. So we're using a, a variational autoencoder here. We're going to pass it through an encoder to get uh, uh, points in the latent space. This is going to be our manifold Z. And uh, our decoder, if it's trained successfully, uh, is going to approximate a function from our latent space Z to the neural state space X. Um, so it's going to approximate this function F that we were after earlier in order to uh, give geometric structure to our template manifold Z here, uh, which we're going to identify with the neural manifold. Um, so the basic recipe for our technique here is you find the topology of the neural manifold using TDA. Uh, once you have that, you set that topology to be the topology of your latent space in the VAE. So we implement um, that for hyperspheres, so uh, spheres of any dimension, as well as products of hyperspheres, so things like tori, uh, as well as Euclidean space. Um, so you run TDA, that gives you what the topology of your latent space should be, and then you set that as the latent space of your VAE. Um, so we have that here. Then uh, the next step is to learn the deformation. So we train our VAE and the decoder is going to approximate this function that takes us from the latent manifold to the neural state space. And once we have that, we're going to extract the geometry from this learned function. So we're gonna pull back the assumed Euclidean metric in the neural state space. That's gonna give a metric structure to the manifold Z. Um, and then we can compute the mean curvature to uh, to understand how it curves within the neural state space. Now there's a pro couple of problems that we tackled, uh, things like VAE non-identifiability, which is the idea that if you have a VAE with a certain decoder F and latent variables Z, um, there are certain transformations that you can apply to the latent space uh, or reparametrizations of the latent space that uh, uh, lead to different decoders, uh, but the VAE being equally optimal. And in this case, uh, interpreting the geometry of the latent space is, uh, is unwise and uh, because the geometry becomes distorted by these reparametrizations. Um, and um, so we tackled that by fixing a parametrization uh, using a supervised loss term to ground the latent parametrization. Uh, so this uh, ensures that we can extract meaningful information about the geometry of the latent space. And so we ran this on synthetic data. So we did we did it for rings or one-dimensional circles. Um, on the left here, we have the sort of the true uh, synthetic data set. And then we have the learned data set by our VAE. And uh, on the right-hand side, we're plotting the learned cur uh, curvature as a function of the angle. And we show that we can do pretty well here. We also ran similar experiments on spherical data sets. So we're able to reconstruct the uh, the spherical data, and then we're also able to compute the mean curvature at every point on the sphere. And similarly, we did it for uh, tori. And now we show uh, the applicability for real neural data using hippocampal data. So these are uh, neurons that are also involved in navigation tasks. So here we have a rat that is running around a circular track. And um, what we're able to do is record from these neurons, these place cells. And uh, in the top panel, we have uh, sort of the recorded ground truth neural activity for this population of place cells. We're able to reconstruct that well um, and learn 
a, uh, a good parametrization for the latent manifold. So let me emphasize that this is a this is 12 neurons at a time. So this is a 12 dimensional um, uh, space, but we're able to visualize the curvature of this um, neural manifold embedded in 12 dimensions. Um, so this gives us an idea of the geometry of the manifold, even though um, we can't directly visualize the 12 dimensional space. Um, we did some error estimation by varying the input noise to the neural manifold, varying the embedding dimension. And uh, we still need to do some more benchmarking and extensive error estimation, um, especially because neural data, real neural data can be quite messy. Um, and uh, running out of time here, but I'll run to the conclusion that we leveraged Riemannian geometry and these topologically aware um, deep uh, learning models to quantify the extrinsic curvature of neural manifolds in the ambient neural state space. And this method allows for visualization of the geometric structure of manifolds in high dimensional spaces. And this may open the door to investigate the uh, geometric correlates of neural circuit function. Um, so with that, um, thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, I'll take any questions if there are any. Let's have one thank the speaker. We are at time, but if there's a quick question in the room, otherwise Francesco put up his uh, contact info here. Do you wanna come up and? Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Um, I mean, is, can, uh, other than the results showing on the primitive shapes, do you have some results on real shapes or some more interesting structures, complicated ones? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for the, oh, sorry about that. So um, I briefly talked about hippocampal data. So this is um, data of uh, recording from rats running around a circular track. Um, let me just play that here. So these rats were running a circular, running around the circular track, and we were recording from neurons that tile um, physical space. So basically, we have neurons that fire uh, at individual locations along the circle. And um, when you when you run topological data analysis on these kinds of neural circuits, you find underlying a circular structure. So you have a ring structure uh, in this high dimensional space. And so we applied it to this kind of neural manifold um, and we were able to visualize the curvature within this space. Um, there are other kinds of uh, neural manifolds. I briefly mentioned grid cells that have this underlying toroidal structure. That's something that we want to apply it to as well. Um, but thus far, we've only implemented this for um, sort of low dimensional hyperspheres and then tori. Um, so it is an interesting question of how, how can we combine sort of these uh, primitives in order to investigate maybe more complicated neural manifolds. That's still a very interesting question. Thank you so much, Francesco. And let's thank all of our speakers from this morning's session again. So we're gonna go on a bit of a lunch break now. It's we lunch until 1.30, where we will have our second keynote to, uh, to kick off our afternoon session. Um, and then we will also be announcing at that point the location of the sort of unhosted social hour for the community as well that will be with walking distance um, at the end of the day. So please come back uh, and we will see you this afternoon. Enjoy your lunch. Yes, thank you, everyone. And we also have five more amazing spotlight talks this yes. afternoon. We, you want to just close out of the Zoom for lunch? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for coming back after lunch. Um, we are going to kick off the afternoon session with our second uh, invited keynote, um, Dr. Vitaly Kerlin, who is at the University of Liverpool in the Materials and Innovation Factory, um, and is going to be speaking to us today about recognizing rigid patterns of unlabeled point clouds. Thank you, Tegan. Many thanks to the organizers for inviting me, especially to Tim and Tegan. 
This paper uh, will be presented at CVCAR, uh, the main track, and joined with my PhD student, Daniel Widdelson. So I encourage you to ask questions during the talk as well, so feel free to stop me. So this paper uh, is... Uh, Second. Now, this paper uh, belongs to uh, the new area of geometric data science that studies many different types of objects. So by data in this particular presentation, uh, we mean uh, point clouds, so clouds of unlabeled points, but we also consider other objects such as uh, periodic lattices and crystals, molecules, protein chains, and so on. So geometric data science appears when uh, data objects are introduced through numerical or digital representations that can be ambiguous. In what sense? In the sense that different rep representations might refer to the same object. But uh, here, of course, it was important. It is important to clarify what we mean by the same object. And uh, this is this question. Same or different, that is the question. This is actually the title of the paper. So that's the reference for the paper. Our motivations came from solid crystalline materials. But this question is important in many other areas, including computer vision and pattern recognition. So what does it mean the same? So in mathematics, we use the word equivalence in this case. And I remind here the formal definition of an equivalence relation. It's a binary relation on any objects that is fine three, three very simple axioms. Reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity, I would say here, is the most important. So less trivial, most important, meaning that if the first object A is equivalent to B and B is equivalent to C, then A is expected to be equivalent to C. And exactly this transitivity axiom justifies a classification namely a splitting into disjoint classes. If uh, two classes of objects overlap say, uh, over a common object B, then the transitivity axiom implies that these two classes should actually coincide. So that's why any well-defined uh, justified classification should be based on an equivalence relation. So first we fix an equivalence relation, and then we classify according to this equivalence relation. And the equivalence relations are everywhere. Well, we actually start learning them in primary school because equality is an equivalence relation. You could write the same number, such as one half, in many different ways. So looking all different, but naturally equivalent to each other. So of course, this is a very simple case, but now let's consider uh, more interesting equivalence relations. So when you look around, so many real-life objects are rigid. And in that case, they should be considered equivalent under rigid motion. So by definition, rigid motion in a Euclidean space is the composition of rotations and translations. And they form uh, the so-called so uh, special Euclidean group SEM. If you allow some mirror reflections, then we get a larger full Euclidean group, EM of isometries. So I will mainly use the uh, word isometry in the talk, uh, but the key results will also hold for strict rigid motion. And isometry, uh, sometimes it's called congruence in Euclidean space, but I prefer the word isometry because it makes sense in a wider context, namely in any metric space. So I'll give a formal definition later, but uh, it's a space with a distance metric. And an isometry is simply any map, any transformation that preserves all interpoint distances. So this is our main equivalence relation for today. Now, why point clouds? <clears throat> because a finite cloud of points is a rather simple object, but also is a most fundamental representation for many real objects, actually at, at different scales. You could start from, from atoms or molecules, and uh, I'm collaborating with chemists, so this is a very natural object for them. But in, in this community, you could consider cars, which are usually rigid. So they could be represented by a collection of corner points. But even uh, you could look at a larger scale to galaxies consisting of stars. So they are moving around, they can be also considered as rigid. 
So here we have uh, two different cases. One simple case is when our points are labeled for order. So if you know the order, P1, etc., PM, when a point cloud in Euclidean space order can be easily reconstructed uniquely up to isometry from the distance matrix. So if you know which distances are and connect each points, well, this is this is a classical result for known from the 20th century. So why uh, distances here are, for example, better than angles? They are better because uh, the Lipschitz continues or so-called uniformly continues. So when we perturb every point up to epsilon, uh, in Euclidean distance, when the distance between points changes by at most two epsilon, I hope it's easy to imagine that it follows formally from the triangle axiom in any metric space. <coughs> So this uniform continuity is very important. The much harder case is when our points are not labeled or not ordered. And this is the most practical case because when you have, say, a laser scan for building, well, there are thousands or even millions of points and they are not ordered, so they, they come in any order. Well, the brute force way in this case would be to consider all possible distance matrices, but of course, it's unrealistic to consider them factorial permutations. Sometimes uh, points might differ. For example, atoms in the molecules usually have atomic types. But well, these atomic types uh, are only assigned when, when we understand our molecule. So when you look through, say, a microscope, you see some blob. It's, it's, not, it's not labeled yet, right? And even, even if you know that some points, some atoms, for example, have labels, some of them are not, uh, cannot be distinct, distinguishable. Even in simple molecules such as water, two hydrogen atoms are identical. They're swappable, so not ordered. So that's why we consider this uh, harder case of M unlabeled points in Rn. So if you ask a simple question, whether one point cloud is isometric to another point cloud, or the same number of points, so that's a simple problem called isometry detection. And it was algorithmically solved actually about 20 years ago. So that's a reasonable polynomial time algorithm. So polynomial in the number of points, of course, exponential in dimension, but for low dimensions, it's, it's fast. But this algorithm outputs only a binary answer. Yes or no, so isometric or not, equivalent or not. What would be more interesting is to have an invariant antimetric because in practice, because of noise at least, any real point clouds will be different. And it would be interesting to, uh, to understand how, how, differ, how different they are. So what's the distance, for example, between them? Now, in, uh, in this area, there are uh, two different concepts, equivariance and invariance. So let me explain the difference. If you have a, a group, for example, a group of Euclidean isometries acting on point clouds, then we could define a G equivariant function. So such a function, say from clouds to some simple space, say to numbers, it's called equivariant. If uh, this function G almost commutes with our group action. So in what sense? So we apply it. Uh, we apply a group action, for example, a rotation to our point cloud when computer function h, and the result is not necessarily the same uh, h of c, but uh, h of c obtained by uh, an easy transformation. So one simple example here, say h of c could be the center of mass of a point cloud. So if you translate our point cloud or rotate it, the center of mass also is translated and rotated. Or you could take simply the first point, if points are labeled again for simplicity, take the first point from a point cloud. If you translate the whole point cloud, the first point is also translated and rotated. So you see this equivariance is actually a rather weak property because there are many functions like that, too many. But uh, the stronger, much stronger and restrictive property concept is invariance. Invariance means that this TG is not simply easy, but it is identity. So nothing changes. 
And in that case, uh, our function is called n invariant. So for our cumulus relation, isometry invariant. So more formally, it means that um, if you have isometric clouds so related by translation, rotation, possibly reflection, when our invariant should take exactly the same value. Or in another form, equivalently, if our invariant takes different values, when we can be 100% sure that our point clouds are not isometric, so they are different. And in the language of computer science, this invariance property means that a function invariant has no false negatives at all for all possible data. So not simply on a finite data set. So never, no false negatives at all. And this property, no false negatives, so invariance actually means that we can reliably distinguish different objects. So the center of mass here doesn't help. Because if you have two point clouds with different centers of mass, it doesn't mean that they're not isometric. They could be related by translation easily. So only invariants can reliably, with 100% certainty, distinguish non isometric objects. So uh, let me mention so in this community, uh, topological data analysis is rather well known. So I'm not giving any definitions, but persistence is an isometry invariant of a point cloud at least for standard filtrations on, on, on this point cloud, such as the Doris Reeves check, the Lona complexes. And let me mention only one, one simple extension of this invariant because resistance is, is not a strong isometry invariant. For example, if you consider these points, so five points in the line, that's a single linkage dendrogram. And this is the classical zero dimensional resistance showing when our clusters merge. So you see it contains only well, five values, but uh, there is a way to make this invariant stronger. Uh, so you call that merge gram, and that's how it looks for exactly the same object. So here, even in the line, you could uh, easily find another five points, so not isometric, but with the same merge values or depth values here. But uh, they can be distinguished by the merge graph. So it's, it is a strictly strong invariant. So, so invariants could be weak or strong. So we will be interested uh, ultimately in complete or sometimes what I call injective or separating invariants. So let me again summarize. Look, if you have a non-invariant, when using this non-invariant in real life, I would say it could be even dangerous because on final data set, you could estimate say 1% of failures. But now imagine you apply it in real life and your self-driving car arrives at a destination with 100% chance of failure. Well, so you'll decide, well, you will go, you'll take your family with you. But uh, so that's why invariants are much more reliable. But uh, within the invariants, we have, we have a large variety. So we will be interested in the strongest so-called complete invariants, but distinguish all different objects. So more formally, uh, an, an invariant is called complete if, so if this invariant takes the same values only if our objects are isometric. And then again, in the language of computer science, it means that this descriptor or more exactly invariant has no false positives at all. For example, for humans, so for our audience, the birthday is an invariant. If two people have different birthdays, they are different. But this is not a complete invariant. In, in a large group of students, with a high probability, you'll find different students with the same birthday. But DNA code, for example, is considered practically complete. So there are so-called twins with exactly the same DNA, but for Serious situations such as court trials, DNA samples are considered almost complete. So now I formally state after all these motivations the isometry problem. So we are looking for an invariant that maps what is formally defined on isometry classes of clouds. So it should be an isometry invariant to something to, to a simpler space. So it could be numbers, vectors, matrices. So some other objects that are easier to compare. 
easy of an original clause. Satisfying several conditions. So first, completeness. This is already hard. So any cloud should be isometric if and only if the invariant is exactly the same value. And that means that it is a DNA style code. If no false negatives, no false positives. The second property which wasn't previously considered is Lipschitz continuity. Lipschitz means that when we perturb points up to epsilon, the invariant changes, but slightly up to a constant times epsilon. And this change should be measured with a metric. So metric D on invariant values. Satisfying with metric axioms. The first metric axiom is actually equivalent to till the completeness because it says what distance is zero only for isometric clouds. So to check isometry, we simply compute the distance, but also the symmetry and triangle inequality. But we have added more conditions because if we only consider the previous two conditions, completeness and continuity, well, there are actually many complete invariants easily available. For example, you could you could take all isometric images of a point cloud. So from a mathematical point of view, yeah, it's it's everything. It's it's formally complete, but not helpful, right? Not helpful at all. You could similarly consider the M factorial distance matrices, so complete and continuous, or in other situations when people talk about so-called interatomic potentials, these potentials are often decomposed in a basis of infinitely many functions. And of course, like infinite size decomposition, well, it can be called complete, but again, in practice, it's truncated and, way, and at this point, we lose completeness. So a practical environment should have should be not only complete and continuous, but also computable. And by computability, we mean that the invariant and the metric on invariant values should be computable in a polynomial time in the number of points for a fixed dimension. So of course, we don't expect polynomial time in the dimension, but at least for lower dimensions such as two, three, four, the most practical cases, uh, we aim for a polynomial time in the number of points. The final condition that can be stated in many different ways. So here I briefly describe it as a geographic style map. So it actually means what we don't only have complete and computable invariant, but also a simple enough invariant so that we could go back from an invariant to an original object. So it's reconstructability or inverse design. So we like to describe all real, realizable values of an invariant um, that allow us to reconstruct an original cloud from a value of this invariant. <laughs> so usually in mathematics we start from a simple case and on this problem the simple case comes from school geometry so i hope you remember the sss theorem about triangles indeed when we have well, two points would be too easy let's start with three but for three points in a euclidean space SSF theorem says that two triangles or two sets of two clouds of three points are congruent or isometric if and only if they have the same trip of sides ABC. So consider it up to six permutations. If you exclude reflections, so only translations or rotations, rigid motion, then we should allow only three cyclic permutations on these sides. So why is it a great theorem? So this is probably my favorite theorem in the whole mathematics. So it's great because it is an ideal solution to the problem. So these three numbers 
uh, very easy to compute, they're continuous, and they also satisfy this final condition, they give a map. Because uh, this space or cloud isometry space so on three points has a very simple description. So three numbers say ordered, uh, the last inequality is simply the triangle inequality, the longest, oh, sorry, uh, it should be yeah, less than A plus B, of course. Uh, but this is a complete description. So uh, I have sketched this triangular column here in three coordinates ABC and have shown also the yellow section to, to make it easier to understand. So for example, uh, this diagonal, when A equals B equals C, represents all equilateral triangles. Right? And on the boundary of this uh, yellow section, we have two types of isosceles triangle. So we have uh, equal long signs and equal short signs. And uh, that boundary actually represents the degenerate cases when three points are on a line. So this is, you see, this is an ideal description and probably Euclid actually has drawn this map, maybe on sand, maybe even in color, but hasn't been done for four points. So the next case, four points, has not been done for more than 2,000 years, to my surprise. But the, yeah, there was progress. So let me mention geometric deep learning that uh, trains neural networks to uh, output isometry invariance by design, but unfortunately without proofs of completeness and continuity. So let me mention the parallel progress in, in computational geometry. So about 20 years ago, Wooten and Kemper proved that a rather simple invariant consisting of all sorted pairwise distances is generically complete in any Euclidean space. So in what sense? <laughs> It distinguishes almost all clouds of unlabeled points except some singular configurations. So in general position. For example, uh, this, is, this is a classical counterexample to, 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 uh, to this invariant. So you see here a trapezoid and a kite, two non-isometric sets of only four points, but they have exactly the same six pairwise distances, unfortunately. Right? So I learned only uh, several months ago that this is not a one counterexample. There is a huge family of counterexamples for four points on the plane. So this family depends on four free parameters. So the whole space actually of four point clouds up to isometry is five dimensional. Why five dimensional? Because we have six distances, but these distances cannot be arbitrary. But the tetrahedron on this uh, four points in the plane should have volume zero. So that's an extra polynomial equation on six distances. That's why the space is generally five dimensional. But on this five dimensional space, there is a huge family of clouds. So C plus and C minus will have exactly the same six pairwise distances. So we're actually shown here, they differ only C by one point. So replace P plus by P minus and six distances remain the same. So are there any strong invariants? Yes, so we introduced, so this was in the paper in uh, Nurex last year, point with distant distribution. So it was actually considered previously in, uh, by, by other people under different names, but we have proved uh, stronger, stronger theorems about this invariant, and also not uh, for a finite case, but for periodic sets of points, modeling periodic crystals. So if you have um, M points, actually in any metric space, you could uh, write down distances to neighbors, say up to K neighbors in the following matrix. So for every point, distances to neighbors in increasing order. For example, for the top left vertex, distances to neighbors in this example, root two to root 10. Accidentally due to symmetry of the top right vertex has exactly the same distances. And in that case, it's convenient to collapse these two identical rows and assign the weight. So one half here with the weight, meaning that 50% of the points have the same distances to neighbors. So that's how this point with distance distribution looks for the trapezoid. 
example, was the kite example. So clearly strong invariant. It's also it's almost obvious it's generically complete because if all pairwise distances are distinct, then from this matrix we could reconstruct a classical distance matrix. Because every distance appears twice if, if they are distinct. So for one endpoint for, for, for another endpoint. But what is more important, we can compare these matrices not simply by equality, but uh, continuously by using actually many metrics on weighted distributions, but we used in experiments earth mover distance. So this earth mover distance is briefly illustrated. In this picture, well, it's drawn for a periodic case, but imagine it's a finite cloud of points, it's similar. So we prove the following. So earth mover distance briefly transforms rows of one matrix into rows of another matrix in the most optimal way. So in this particular case, if you have one row consisting of ones and after perturbation two rows, we uh, naturally split these two rows in two halves and then compare them one by one. So formally we proved that if we perturb points up to epsilon, well, the earth mover distance is up to two epsilon between the PDD invariants. So that slip should continue. So now we are looking for invariants stronger than PDD. So far, we haven't found any counter examples for clouds in the plane. So it's a conjecture that this is a complete invariant for, for dimension two. But we know examples when PDD is not complete for some clouds in, in the three-dimensional space. So that's why we constructed a stronger invariant that distinguished all of them. So this is a summary of invariants starting from sorted distance vector I mentioned initially. So PDD is actually, is actually here. So that's uh, on this intermediate step. <clears throat> okay, let me uh, now explain with strong invariants. So if you have, uh, so let me remind you, we have a cloud of M and labeled points, and we start from the more general case, any metric space. So we'll build built invariant called simplex wise distance distribution. So C is a cloud and H is an integer parameter say in order. So if H is one, then the invariant is the original one PDD, point with distance distribution. But now when H is more than one, when we build first the following uh, matrix called relative distance distribution. So we choose a sequence of points, H points, say mm -hmm. for H equal of two, it's only a pair of points. And we built the matrix with uh, M minus H permutable columns of distances from all other points to our two selected points. For example, very simple example, we have triangle. If you choose points P2 and P3, then the first, the first element uh, in this pair is actually the distance matrix on, on, on that pair, which is simply, well, the length A. Yeah, the length A between the points. And then uh, this Relative distance uh, with relative distance distribution is, is a pair of distances from only our remaining point P1 to our fixed two points. And that's how uh, we look for, for other choices. So here we have only three choices of subset A, and we build three relative distance distributions. Since points um, were chosen in an ordered way, we should consider them up to permutations. So this, uh, this matrix is, is one representative, but any permutation of two points simply swaps the rows here. So we should consider these RDDs pairs uh, up, to, up to permutations of, of H points. 
And uh, then we take all these classes of RDD pairs into one invariant called simplex wise distance distribution. So SDD uh, is an unordered collection of relative distance distributions for all unordered subsets of subsets A consisting of H points, but consider adaptive with extra equivalence of the permutations. So the next one trivial case is when H is two. A lot strong invariant distinguished all previous counterexamples to the completeness of past invariants in the three dimensional space. So the theorem from the paper says what? Well, it is an invariant, but can't be computed in the following time. Lipschitz continues with small constant. And we can also compute the metric on this invariance in this time, where L is the size of line variant, which is roughly um, m to the power h. So when h, h is two, for example, or h is small, so all these times are polynomial in the number of points. So what's uh, the general case in the metric space? So we don't have completeness because metric spaces are rather general, so it's hard to prove. But for the Euclidean case, we went one step further and improved this invariant to a complete one. So this is actually examples of clouds of only six points of three-dimensional space dependent on three parameters. So uh, the line segments here shown in the same color have the same length but variable length so you could choose any values for l1 l2 l3 and you get that pair that has exactly the same point with distant distributions so it was hard to distinguish our next invariant distinguished one and we proved it not computational but manually so it is possible to to compute it manually and, and prove that distinguishes everything Okay, now uh, the Euclidean case. So when we have Euclidean structure, we have the center of mass. You can take the sum of the points leverage. So the center of mass now can be easily fixed at low origin. That's the first natural step. In that case, when we have one fixed point, the only ambiguity is up to rotations. So it is still a hard problem find the complete invariant up to rotations, but nonetheless, we now need to choose only n minus one points. For example, in the plane, only one extra point. In freedom of space, only two extra points. Okay. <clears throat> so similar to the previous more general invariant in the metric space, we first write down uh, the oriented center distribution, which is the pair of the distance matrix on, on the subset and the origin, the center of mass, and then also the matrix M of distances. So for, for every other point, not fixed, write down column of distances from that point to our fixed points. Now, if you're interested in rigid motion, when reflections are excluded, then uh, we need something extra because distance is, of course, preserved under reflection, so we lose, uh, so we need something extra to reconstruct up to rigid motion. So we add the sign of the determinant, well, in a very similar way. So on the vectors from any other point to our fixed points, so including the origin. And finally, simplex wise center distribution is an ordered, an ordered collection of classes of all these pairs, as usual, and the, and the permutations of these n minus one points for all unordered subsets in, in SIM.
Any questions so far? Yeah, so this is a uh, rather technical definition. So let me show an example. So an example here, uh, S is a set of four points of a very simple square in the plane. So blue points are in our S. Uh, the origin here is the center of mass. Then, so in the plane, we choose only one point. So A is a one-point subset. And then the distance matrix from these two points is just one number. So always one for any choice. Then this matrix has three columns because after choosing one point, only three points remain. And if you choose, for example, this uh, point on the right, one, zero, then that matrix uh, looks as follows. So root two, root two, and two are distances from three other points to our point P1. One, one, one are the distances from all other points to the center of mass, the origin. And these are signs, uh, signs of, uh, so matrices uh, Q minus P1, Q minus zero. So that sign is zero uh, in, the, in, in that special case when three points are in a single line. The term is zero. So that's essentially the whole invariant because when we choose another point, due to rotational symmetry, we get exactly the same matrix. So final invariant for this example, simplex wise center distribution is simply one pair written here. That's the whole description. But now to prove Lipschitz continuity, we need something extra. Because that sign, so it was needed for reconstruction up to rigid motion, but that sign creates discontinuity. Because when, uh, for example, we have a triangle which degenerates, so this uh, signed area changes, changes, that sign changes discontinuously. So this was actually the hardest part in the whole, in the whole investigation, we needed some simple Lipschitz continuous function defined on the simplex. We called it the strength. So the formula looks rather simple. So it's squared volume over the half perimeter of the simplex to the power two n minus one. Uh, but it was not easy to guess. So let me consider the simple case again, a triangle <coughs> in the plane. We have triangle of sides ABC. But by Heron's formula for the area, that's how the strength looks. It's a cubic, cubic function over the squared function. So roughly it is a linear function, roughly. So it's not exactly linear, of course, but what, what rough linearity allows us to prove but this function, actually in any dimension, is Lipschitz continuous with a small constant. So if you have upper bounds for all this constant in any dimension. So when we perturb points, the strength of a simplex changes a, a little bit up to lambda n times epsilon. And well, this strength of the simplex allows us to prove you now the full completeness and continuity result in the Euclidean space. So the simplex y center distribution, the complete invariant under rigid motion, computable in this time, small Lipschitz constant in the f moves distance. So this is for rigid motion if if now we do, do not distinguish mirror images, then there is a simple way. So uh, any mirror reflection preserves all distances, but changes the signs in our determinants that we 
we used. So we have instead of, so in addition to SCD, we have its so-called mirror image where the signs are reversed. And that pair is a complete invariant on the isometry now. Okay, um, so what's next? So you remember there was a final condition, geographic style map or reconstructability. So now we can study with uh, cloud isometry spaces as, as geographic maps. So CIS, cloud isometry space, M points in a Euclidean space RN. For four points, you might remember uh, a picture like that from school geometry textbook. So how different um, types of quadrilaterals relate to each other. For example, squares, any square is a rectangle, also a rhombus, <laughs> and both these types are parallelograms. Uh, this is a discrete tree, discrete description, not a continuous map. And now we can show a continuous map of all these quadrilaterals. So let me remind you, uh, for four points in the plane, our space has dimension five. So it's a six distances with one polynomial equation, saying that the tetrahedron has volume zero. If you additionally add uniform scaling, then we reduce dimension by one, right? So we get now four dimensional space, which is still non-trivial. So harder than in the case of triangles. So these six distances are actually not suitable for parameterizing our space, because if you take six positive numbers, even satisfying all triangular qualities, well, we get a cloud of four points on these four, six distances with probability zero because of that extra equation for the volume of the tetrahedron. And of course, for any more points, the situation is similar. So distances are not convenient. We need, we need better parameters. Again, let's start from a simple case of triangles, three points. The center of mass at low origin. Now let's, so all of points are not ordered, but one of them will be the most distant from the center of mass. So let's call it P1 and say it's at distance R, but under uniform scaling, you could assume R is one. So if one point now is fixed at this position, R zero, then how could we get a triangle? Well, if you choose a point P2 somewhere here, when the point P3 will be uniquely determined because the center of mass is fixed. For example, if you take point P2, on that line, vertical line, on P3 will be symmetric because the center of mass should be at the origin. So here, for, for this choice of P2, we get isosceles triangles. If you choose P2 on this arc, blue arc, then we also get an isosceles triangle, but looking slightly differently. So these two sides should be equal. And if uh, P2 is inside, in this yellow region, then we get a generic triangle. So that's, that's the space of triangles. Uh, so more exactly, we should identify, should identify the boundaries under reflection in the x-axis. So for example, all equilateral triangles may correspond to these two red points. So we should, we should glue these boundaries like what? And Degenerate cases, so degenerate triangles appear here. Well, three points are in straight line. So, so in a sense, it's equivalent to, to the previous picture I have shown with a triangle cone. I'm pretty sure Euclid also imagined the triangle cone before, but this is a new, see, with new coordinates. And now we can extend this approach to four points. Again, simple case, parallelograms. The most distant point 
is as before, say at R0. And then how could we get a parallelogram? So in the parallelogram, the opposite, uh, we have actually two points uh, that are most distant from the center of mass. So P1 and P3. So P3 here is fixed. If we, if we choose uh, P2, one more point on that blue arc, we get a rectangle. Because P4 is uniquely determined since the center of mass is fixed at origin. So that's how we get all rectangles. We choose P2 on that vertical diameter, we get a rhombus. So with boundary cases are rhombi and rectangles and squares correspond to these red points. Already good, let's move to new cases. So you might have seen uh, another type, kite. So kite means what, as usual, P1 is fixed here at R0, but P3 is variable. It's not, <laughs> sorry, it's not at minus R0, it's variable here. So it could be convex or not non-convex. But if additionally, if additionally um, P2, Additionally, we have a symmetry with respect to this x-axis when, uh, when we get a kite. So uh, P, P3 is variable here. If P3 and P4 are symmetric, uh, sorry, P2 and P4 are symmetric, when, when we get a kite, it's a two-parameter subspace. But if, um, if uh, they're not symmetric, we get a more general quadrilateral. So I called it Mediagonal quad. Mediagonal means that one diagonal is split in exactly into two halves. So here x is variable, uh, but if you fix p2 anywhere in this yellow region, one p4 is uniquely determined. Again, because, because the center of mass is fixed at origin. <clears throat> so medi mediagonal quads. <clears throat> And one more interesting case, when you have a quad with two, with two vertices at the same distance to the center of mass. So I call them isoradial, adjacent vertices. The one is fixed as usual. And then, so if our one point, say P4, is on, on that boundary, then we can get an isosceles trapezoid. So that was uh, the midpoint of that segment. Since the origin is the center of mass, then other two points should have the central, well, the symmetric position of that midpoint. So we get an isosceles trapezoid when, when this line is parallel to that one. But what case can be expanded to isoradial quad when uh, this line is not necessarily parallel to P1, P4? So what you see here that uh, we have coordinates that satisfy only inequalities. So we could sample them and always get a quadrilateral. So not as with distances previous. <clears throat> So this is uh, now a new continuous map where I have shown, well, it should be see, five dimensional in general, but I have tried to show it as much as possible with known classes and new classes. For example, so this class is known from school where all central is symmetric. So that point in the center shows center of mass and also center of symmetry. These classes are mirror symmetric. We have a mirror symmetry, say, as also a trapezoid kite. But we have now more generic classes, so the radial quotes, mediagonal quotes, depending on four parameters, without uniform scale, and finally general quadrilaterals. So the key idea is that we can choose a point in our space and get always. 100% certainty a quadrilateral from that. Uh, 
and yeah, I think it's yeah, it will be convenient to finish soon. So, <clears throat> so what geometric data science does is uh, understanding of a structure of an object. So in our case, it was a point cloud up to isometry. So previously, you could consider invariance or non-invariance or invariance incomplete or discontinuous. And then, yeah, we map our initial good structures to latent space where we lose some structure because of incompleteness or discontinuity. But now we have complete and continuous invariance that map our initial good objects to a modular space of these objects. And this arrow is reversible. So we could go back without loss of any information. And that's, that's why we can now predict properties better. Because here, no information was lost. We can study our function, say, energy of molecules on that complete model space. <clears throat> so geometric data science puts all data objects, so more exactly equivalence classes of these objects, that uniquely defined locations on a map, continuous map. And let me finish with these uh, key concepts of geometric data science. So we start from any data objects and we consider them up to an equivalence relation, which is practically important, for example, isometry. Then we define metrics that should be continuous and computable. So four pillars of geometric data science and the key results are Crystal isometric space for periodic crystals from New York's paper and in CVPR, it's an isometric classification of finite point clouds. But these are not only two results, so these are the first two results, right? Because geometric data science can be applied to any data object, so to any transformation. It's not only isometries, but there are more general affine equivalences, projective transformations, and so on. So that's why collaborations are welcome. Thank you. Time for questions. So I appreciate going to the, the smaller dimensional cases for our understanding. How does this then, these results move us in the direction for thinking about something like the autonomous vehicle example that you gave? Does this help us in asserting and understanding the confidence of model of least sufficiently constrained architecture or is there a translation into that same example that you gave so this uh this theorem yeah this one <laughs> this theorem she holds in any Euclidean space for any number of points so of course I have drawn uh the maps only in the simplest case because it's very natural, but in principle, this, uh, this result has been proved in any dimension. So we simply haven't uh, had opportunities to, to do it for more than four points explicitly. But if you're interested, in principle, yeah, we are happy to collaborate to discuss. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so again, this uh, so injective maps from yeah potentially so well, this is what we have done so we have mapped uh, point clouds so injectively and uh, reversibly to a model a space so without loss of any information because the invariant is complete and also reversible so you could go back 
to our original object. Uh, when you say, well, the problem has been solved. You don't need neural networks when variants have been constructed. So you wouldn't use neural networks to distinguish triangles, right? Because SSS theorem from school geometry says that three sides are enough. ABC. What we have done is to extend that theorem to any point clouds in Euclidean space. Problem has been solved. Um, I'm not sure I grasp the definition of these modular spaces exactly. I'll ask nevertheless, how much do you know about like the topology? Yeah, good question. <clears throat> topology is a simple question. So it's well, for example, our uh, space looks topologically as an open disk or, or, or sphere. Yeah, we could, all, we could also investigate it, but we went uh, to a deeper question, to geometry, to matrix and continuous matrix. So it's, so it's much harder. But you're right, of course, it, I'm pretty sure it's, well, some, okay, more exactly, uh, well, so what spaces, okay, for point clouds, it's clearly contractible. Because, say, for four points, we could continuously deform it to, to a square, right? So what space of isometric classes is contractible to a point? The topology is rather trivial. Um, okay. <clears throat> so I'm wondering if, as I understand it, this uh, gets you uh, a way to check for an uh, exact for how easy would it be to be for uh, extend this to the quality uh, equalities? So uh, that's why we were interested in a continuous metric. So earth move resistance on this invariance is computable in this time. So here M is the number of points, N is the ambient dimension, and L is the size of our invariant. So roughly it is uh, M to the power, in that case, N minus one. So the three-dimensional space, uh, this will be yeah, m to the power seven and a half. Yeah, so it's yeah, it's a bit large, but still polynomial. And in the plane, it's uh, m to the power three and a half. Yeah, any last quick questions? Okay, well, let us thank our speaker. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me right now. Let me share my screen. Yes, if you just give us one second to switch over the laptops, then we can turn it over to you, Anak. Thanks, Vitaly. Mm -hmm. You should be able to share your screen now. Awesome. So okay, that's that's coming through fine. Yeah, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Okay, so our, our paper is titled "Topology Aware Focal Loss for 3D Image Segmentation." And this work was uh, produced by uh, Novartis Institutes of Biomedical Research and uh, Mass General Hospital. Uh, segmentation models frequently uh, encounter topological inaccuracies such as developing areas, disrupted connections and voids. And current approaches, uh, they struggle adequately address topological errors and class at the same time. So our goal in this paper is to present a novel loss function, which is named topology aware, aware focal loss, that combines the benefits of focal loss with a topological constraint term. Um, so this figure uh, shows the significance of topological 
uh, accuracy neuron image segmentation tasks. The aim is to segment membranes which divide the image to um, areas representing individual neurons. So it depicts an, an input neuron image and in B, we show the ground truth segmentation of the membranes and the resulting neuron regions. C presents the results from a baseline without topological uh, assurance. And you can see that some, even some minor pixel wise errors can result in disrupted membranes, which in turn lead to uh, the merge of numerous uh, neurons into a single entity. And in D, it, we demonstrate um, the method with topological correctness, which yields the correct topology and successful uh, partitions of the, uh, of the neuron, neurons. Uh, so uh, we can summarize the key contributions of our paper as follows. So first of all, uh, our loss function incorporates a topological uh, constraint grounded on the Wasserstein distance between the persistence diagrams of the ground truth and the predicted segmentation masks. And we employ a CNOP algorithm uh, to effectively compute the transport pl plan between persistence diagrams. And uh, the application of topology aware focal loss on ED unit uh, trained with the data from the brain tumor segmentation challenge proved to be successful. And by adding logical constraint as a penalty term to realize the focal loss, uh, we showed that segmentation performance was substantially improved. So, uh, topology aware focal loss uh, model builds. 3D unit architecture, which is widely recognized effectiveness in biomedical image segment. So the 3D units architecture is a two part with an encoding section that captures the content and features within the image and the decoding sec that uses this extracted information for accurate localization and segmentation. So this model addresses these topological errors by introducing a novel loss function, topology aware focal loss. And this function combines two components, one the per pixel focal loss and then the topology, the topological constraint. Uh, the focal loss component is a wide used method to manage class imbalance by giving higher importance to harder to classify pixels. Uh, now I'll explain the use case of our model on a uh, glioma segmentation. So glioma segmentation refers to the process of identifying and tracking uh, glioma from the rest of the brain tissue images. And this is a crucial step in diagnosing and treating these conditions. Provides valuable information about the morphology of the tumor. And uh, it also informs uh, the doctors about the treatment decisions, helps in tracking the progression or progression of the disease. Deep learning algorithms, really CNNs have shown significant promise improving the accuracy uh, of glioma segmentation. So the process begins by um, training a model on a large set of annotated brain scans. Gliomas have been expertly labeled. And uh, uh, this automated segmentation process uh, assists the radiology by providing more accurate and consistent results. Uh, patients typically undergo diagnostic procedures like imaging scans and biopsies to determine the nature of their condition. And, uh, then doctors categorize the tumor histopathologically, grade the tumor safety, and identify specific molecular markers. It's essential to differentiate between low-grade and high-grade gliomas and tumors with MGMT gene mutation uh, because these two classifications have substantially different prognosis and chemo treatments. It's also worth noting that these tissue biopsies, while they are informative, they are very invasive procedures that can sometimes pose high risks. So developing more robust segmentation models can help us build AI models that can non-invasively characterize tumors' uh, submolecular characteristics. Additionally, according to TCGA, uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas report, only 35% of biopsy samples have adequate tumor content to allow for a molecular characterization. So this highlights the urgent need for development of non-invasive methods that cannot accurately diagnose uh, 
tumors or augmentation of on MRI scan images also effectively monitor changes uh, and progress in tumor conditions over time. So um, state of in brain tumor segmentation are typically and the variants of UNET. Uh, UNET architecture is one of the most popular architectures for medical imitation. It has long skip connections and an outlink path to recover the original image result. And uh, 3D UNET is a very unit uh, specifically designed for volume medical image segmentation, such as MRI scans. It uses 3D convolutions instead of 2D. And recently, I think the, uh, the most uh, popular technique is the attention unit, which uses an attention mechanism to allow the model to focus on certain areas of the image during the segment process. Uh, so, last work has investigated the use of radiogenic measures to determine glioma uh, mutation status. MGMT promoter mutation analysis is vital for predicting treatment outcomes. Uh, so, topological data analysis holds promise for MRI based learning. Uh, we choose the unit as our uh, model architecture uh, based on its outstanding performance shown in the ablation studies of past work. Uh, and persistent homology also, which is a key technique in TDA, has been effectively used in uh, image and pattern recognition across a wide range of fields, such as uh, tumor classification or uh, neuron morphology analysis. And specifically, TDA has been very instrumental in the classification of various tumors. Um, so classical techniques, uh, stick to 2D analysis of images, think on basic topological features like components and loops. We use 3D scans to extract important features, pulling two-dimensional topological features. So this means we are looking at the cavities in the 3D structures, which gives us a better way uh, to look at the tumor structure. So persistent homology is a, is a pretty cool in TDA. It helps us to study data features across an increasing sequence of shapes. So what goes in, we input growing sequence of simplicial complexes and um, what comes out, we get things called uh, persistent uh, uh, And we have a few methods there, such as cubical complexes, VR complexes, alpha check and uh, Delnai complex. And for this task, we are using cubical complex. Uh, persistent homology was our main to distinguish shapes uh, of structures. So when we talk about I-dimensional homology, uh, we are just counting the number of I-dimensional holes. And what is zero-dimensional holes? Those are just connected parts. And when we have an example with, uh, so here in the, in the first example, we have six uh, connected components. So the zero-dimensional homology has rank six. Uh, and in the second example here, we have three loops. So one dimension homology has rank three, and the third example has six loops. So one dimension homology has rank six. Has rank six. We can also count of two dimensional holes, and uh, you can picture a hollow sphere or a donut, and each one of those single two dimensional hole. So two dimension homology has rank one in these cases. So uh, this example uh, can help you with how we operate uh, persistent on 3D MRI scans. So first, we take a 3D MRI image, think of it as a cube filled with tinier cubes, and a certain shade of gray ranging from zero, which is to 255, which is white. And we arrange these cubes into a series of images based on how dark or how light. So starting from the darkest, which is zero, to the lightest, which is 255, we create a sort of flip book of images. Then we use TDA tool called distant homology and we keep track of all shapes and structures like connected components and voids as we go through this flipbook. Now we get at the end uh, is a detailed analysis of all the shapes and structures in our original 3D MRI image, which can be useful for classification or segmenting of medical images. So in this example, imagine a timeline where things come to life and disappear. So at threshold less than or equal to negative two, we have one thing appearing. And then at threshold less than or equal to negative one, two more things show up on the screen. 
But as time goes on, some things merge together. For instance, at threshold less than or equal to one, one thing vanishes and becomes part of another. And at threshold less than or equal to two, another thing also disappears. So we left with uh, a summary of a summary of uh, different shapes and structures. Uh, we summarize all of them with persistent diagrams. Uh, in this case, uh, the persistent barcodes would be negative two to infinity, and from one to one, and from negative one to two, which give us a clear picture of the structure of our data set. So it's like a condensed story of what. Uh, so this is another example. It depicts grayscale image with pixel different pixel intensities ranging from zero, which is the black, and one, which is the white. B represents the steps of cubicle filtration process, where increasing the threshold adds points, edges, and squares capture image structure. And C shows persistence diagrams for zero and one dimension homology representing connected pieces and loops. Uh, so connected pieces die as they merge, and the loops uh, disappear, more pixels are added. Uh, and persistence diagrams are collections of pairs that signal by the emergence and uh, disappearance of topological features in our data sets. Our objective is to determine the optimal transport plan, which enables the matching of points between the two persistent diagrams of ground truth and predicted segmentation masks in the most efficient manner. And to compute the optimal transport plan, optimal transport distance between those two persistence diagrams, we begin by creating a cost matrix, C, and C represents the cost of matching uh, point in the first persistence diagram to point J in one. And using the optimal transport plan matrix B and the cost matrix C, we calculate the distance as the sum of element-wise uh, multiplication between P and C, denotes, uh, denoted with the equation right here. So this distance uh, value represents the Wasserstein distance between the two persistence diagrams. Explaining our algorithm to compute the optimal transport to explain doubly stochastic matrix. It's a special matrix where the sum of uh, where the where the sum of each row and each column is equal to one. So uh, think of it as a matrix where the entries represent probabilities or proportions that distribute evenly across both rows and columns, uh, and they are useful uh, such as in optimization problems uh, and problems that require probability theory because they ensure the conservation of mass or probabilities. I can pass this. And the uh, synchron alg synchronop algorithm that we used in our paper is an iterative method to approximate the stochastic matrix. It operates by uh, iteratively normalizing the matrix along its rows and columns to achieve row and columns to one. And this algorithm is commonly employed in optimal transport plan problems to efficiently compute optimal transport plan between the two distributions. So in the sync or NOP algorithm, um, we start by setting the no row normalization vector u and column ve normalization vector v. And these vectors have n and m number of elements, respectively, corresponding to the number of rows and columns in the cost matrix C. Each element u is initially set to 1 over m, and each element is initially set to 1 over m presenting a uniform distribution over the columns. And this initialization helps ensure the matrix is doubly stochastic during the process. So during the synchronop algorithm, the row normalization vector u, column ve normalization vector v are up iteratively. Uh, their purpose is to normalize rows and columns uh, of the optimal plan matrix and transforming in it doubly stochastic matrix. Uh, and Iterative process helps us to achieve better uh, and mass co conservation. So in the con context of uh, optimal plan, uh, the cost matrix represents transporting mass from each point in the source set to each point in the target set. So for example, in the case of persistence diagram, uh, the cost matrix ensures the distance between the birth and death times of topological features in the two diagrams. And each entry in the cost matrix represents the cost of matching a specific feature from one diagram to a specific feature from other diagram. Uh, we transport, we 
transform the cost matrix C into K, which is an exponentiated version with entropic regularization for easier computation. So uh, the algorithm iteratively updates and V until a convergence condition is satisfied, right, uh, and this enhances the accuracy of the optimal transport plan. So I'm um, um, sorry, we're at time. Do you want to jump to your conclusions real quick? Sure, yeah. Uh, I think we can go over this part and... Uh, I'm the schedule. Yeah, so I, I think if you've got like a, a 30 second wrap up, we can do that, but then we have to move on to the next speaker. Okay. So, um, well, in this section, uh, we specifically show that topology aware focal loss uh, plays a crucial role, capturing both the pixel wise details and also capturing the underlying topological structure. Uh, here, we basically merge focal loss and we modulate the topology with a small coefficient like uh, 0 0.001 to yield optimal stability in our loss convergence. And finally, I think and come to the uh, conclusion part, training visual dice score. Okay, dice plays a crucial role in quantifying the effectiveness of brain tumor segmentation. So uh, we use enhancing tumor dice score to measure the overlap between the predicted and actual enhancing tumor regions. Uh, also, we look at other scores like whole tumor dice score and um, a TC score, which is the um, tumor core dice, score, which evaluates the overlap between the ground truth and predicted uh, necrotic tumor. And these are the visualization Thank of you. our segmentation model. Presentation. Unfortunately, we do have to move to the next speaker. I yeah, that's okay. Any questions we can link up in the, the zoom let's let's thank our speaker real quick yeah can you throw your email address in the zoom chat so that we can make it available to people if they have follow-on questions for you specifically awesome. I'll, I'll make sure that goes out to you again i think if you want to use mine that works yeah i'm also needed this I either or why don't we why don't we do that because my emails all closed. Got it, got it. Um I just have to <laughs> All right, well then we're gonna take a second while uh, we're doing some tech shifts here. Um, uh, during the break, we'll be breaking at three um, and we can kind of put the same breaks that they have in the main conference. During that, we'll also put up the address and location for the seminar that we're gonna have this evening. It's walking distance from here. It's at the Lions Pub. I'll have the address up there. Um, they are reserving a Got space for us. We'll be able to work that so there's some details I'll give for that as we go into the break. But um, in case you needed to jet off, uh, it will be the Lions Pub from 5 until 6.30 this Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think it's a bit shorter talk, so I, we should get time. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is joint work with Henry Kavingi, uh, and it has the descriptive title, Making Corgis Important for Honeycomb Classification, Adversarial Attacks on Concept-Based Explainability Tools. Um, right. So. Uh, concept-based interpretability is like 
explainability is uh, is is one tactic people take uh, for trying to understand neural networks, and and the basic schematic setup looks like this. So uh, we have this image deep learning model. It's taking in images and having some output. Uh, in this case, let's say it's a classification output. Um, and in concept-based interpretability methods, uh, we have a, a positive, a set of positive tokens that encodes some concepts. So uh, for this example, P sub C encodes the bubbly concept. And then we have a set in sub C of negative tokens. These are just like random images that do not encode this concept. Um, we pass them through to some hidden layer L of a deep neural network, and then we learn a linear probe that uh, classifies the positive examples or tokens of this concept uh, from the negative examples. Then we take the vector that is normal to this hyperplane, and this is our concept of vector. Uh, intuitively, this points towards like the the seed or the conceptness and the steep neural network. And then we can do some interpretability things like this. Uh, one simple example is you can just look at the classification performance of this probe uh, or this linear probe on some held out set. And it gives you like a good, very rough uh, clue as to how, how much this hidden layer encodes this concept. Um, so in our setup, uh, we attack these probes, or uh, and, and as well as the downstream interpretability methods. Um, and in this case, I'm showing a, a targeted attack here. So uh, we have a similar setup before. We're putting we're putting in positive examples of bubbly, and we're trying to learn this linear probe that uh, points towards this concept of bubbly. But now the attacker is. Uh, 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 yeah, trying to mislead this probe. And, and so what's actually happening is, uh, this is the targeted case. There's also an untargeted case. Um, we collect examples for some class we want to mislead the probe towards. So in this case, uh, the target, we're, tar we're going to mislead uh, the, uh, mislead this method to thinking that these bubbly images are actually striped images. Uh, we take the metoid of the, or excuse me, the centroid of this target class C in the hidden layer neural network, and then we design perturbation delta so that we add delta to all of the positive attacks token, or uh, excuse me, all of the bubbly images, and uh, this downstream probe is misled. Um, yeah. So we end up with this. Uh, perturbation that we're adding to the bub bubbly tokens that mislead or causes this probe to now point in the wrong direction. In this targeted case, uh, if this attack is successful, now this vector, rather than pointing towards the C concept, is pointing towards this uh, bubbly concept. Um, so we, we evaluate this attack on two different interpretability methods. Uh, the first is TCAV. This is roughly a measure of how much a model uses a concept when it makes predictions. Uh, namely, this is the directional derivative of uh, the, the output prediction of a model with respect to uh, this concept C. And then we also attack fasted feature visualization. So uh, fasted feature visualization is, an, uh, is a feature visualization approach that synthesizes images to try to understand hidden layers, but uh, it synthesizes images such that they, uh, they point towards this uh, concept uh, C. Uh, and so you can see where the concept probe is, uh, is in this equation with uh, V sub C. And I can like give details as to what I, exactly facet feature visualization is doing after this, if you're interested. Right, so results. Um, for the untargeted attack here, uh, we have some like other results too, but what I'm showing here is um, th uh, three different concepts for Resident 18 trained on this cub birds data set. And uh, we're looking at TCAV magnitude scores. So for the 
baseline and the dotted, you can see that these TCAP magnitude scores are large, suggesting that the model or that this interpretability method uh, is suggesting that the model is using these concepts when making classifications. And then we attack it, we mislead the interpretability method to now think or now um, uh, outputs that the model is not using these classes when making these interpretations. Uh, for the specific class. Like, uh, similarly for the positive or the targeted attack, um, I, this is the part that's like making corgis look like honeycombs. Uh, we're taking uh, the baseline is these dash lines. And now the interpretability method is outputting that in fact, uh, uh, the model is using this honeycomb concept when making predictions about corgis or dumbbells or bubblies. Um, and this is, uh, you know, uh, misleading and, uh, and like doesn't make really much sense. Right. Uh, we also, in our paper, uh, to my understanding, uh, have like the first case of attacking feature visualizations. Uh, Dean Kim has since released uh, like a, a pretty comprehensive paper about this. Uh, yeah. So now, when we do these attacks and create these misleading probes, uh, you can synthesize these images. Uh, and in the non-attack case, you can see that the stripes and the polka dots. Uh, like in the future visualizations look like stripes and polka dots. Uh, but now in these in, in this tax case in this bottom row, um, these feature visualizations now just look like nonsense. Uh, this is for the non-targeted case. So this was as designed. And then we quantify this with the Frisch inception distance. Um, yes. Uh, and what this is saying is that this distance for the faceted feature visualizations on the attack is larger than the baseline, uh, suggesting that like this simple picture we have here uh, is uh, at least somewhat quantifiable. Yeah, so some further questions we studied in our paper. Um, how, how well do these perturbations made using a surrogate model transfer to unseen architectures? So if I'm an attacker, maybe I don't need access to the actual model that the person doing interpretability is using, I can just use my surrogate classifier, have these perturbations, and they'll fool whoever tries to use these. Um, we also asked how effective the attack is on a variant of TCAV uh, called relative TCAV that's actually like more commonly used in like real life interpretability. And we see that it's, it's, it's quite effective there as well. And then we also give a formal threat model. Um, and I'll just also say that like, these concepts are very important for interpretability. There's like a bunch of conjectures about like things that have to be the case for certain concepts. Yet there like hasn't been all that much study on the kinds of properties these concepts have. So it's like a very small step in understanding, uh, you know, that these concepts are subject to the same kinds of attacks that uh, normal deep learning models are. Uh, thank you. Good time for a question or two. Well, I think Davis will probably be happy to stay around and chat for a couple minutes during the break here. Um, so we will be taking a break um, until 345 and we will be resuming and we have our final three spotlight talks um, after that. So please join us for those last three talks. You have yours already. I updated the slides. You can put the, the location of the social hour up on the screen.
Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. We have another three talks, and then we'll have some closing remarks. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Yi Teng Chen from the Ohio State University. Thank you for having me here. So today I'm going to present our work on shape and intensity analysis of glioblastoma multiform tumors. My name is Yi Teng Chen, and this is a joint board with my advisor, Sebastian Kurtek, and we're from the Department of Statistics at The Ohio State University. Yeah, doing it upside down. You can just click on one space. Um, so well. Oh, just so glial. Glioblastoma multiform, or GVM, is a severe type of brain cancer. Patients with GVM have about 12-month median survival time. Clinicians often study GVM tumors using imaging tools, such as magnetic resonance image, or MRI. In particular, they study the tumor shape and intensity that are captured on MRI. So intensity are the color pixel on these images. So the tumor shape and intensity have been found to be correlated with GVM survival in previous researches. However, clinicians often describe or quantify the difference in tumor shape in a way that do not capture the full geometric complexity of the tumor shape. For example, they would describe tumor shape by how circular or how irregular a tumor shape is. Furthermore, clinicians often study shape and intensity separately this can overlook the potential dependence between these two GBM tumor features that are captured on MRI. So our goal is to construct a unified mathematical representation that can integrate and balance MRI-derived tumor shape and intensity information so that we can study them jointly while controlling which information we want to focus on when we make comparisons of tumor shape and intensity. This representation will lead us to have an objective characterization and improve comparisons of MRI-derived GVM tumor shapes and allow us to conduct joint statistical analysis of tumor shape and intensity. To achieve this, we will include properties that are invariant to all shape-preserving transformations in the representation and comparisons of GVM tumor shape and intensity. These transformations include scaling, which involves enlarges or shrinks the object. Translation involves changing the location of the object. Rotation rotates the object. And finally, reparameterization, or how fast you traverse the outline of the object. These are called shape-preserving transformations because they do not change the shape of the object. The data we analyze on include MRI and survival data for 63 patients with GBN from the Cancer Imaging Archive. MRI data include data from two MRI modalities. One is T1-weighted pulse contrast, and the other is T2-flare modality. So each patient will have two MRI data. The tumor contours were segmented semi-automatically, as illustrated by the red close curves on the screen here. You can notice that the two tumor contours look different from the two different MRI modalities, even though they're from the same patient. This is because different MRI modalities highlight tissues differently. So this semi-automatic segmentation results in multiple slices of the images. The slice that we chose to analyze on it from T1 images is the axial slice or the top-down slice that contains the largest tumor area. And the slice we chose to analyze on from T2 images is the slice that has the same anatomical position as the chosen T1 slice. So we chose to first model GBM tumor outline and intensity with 3D parameterized closed curve beta T, which consists of two components. One is the shape component beta CT, representing the XY coordinates of the tumor outline, and the intensity component beta AT, representing the intensity function along the tumor outline. We then standardize beta T separately for each component for the shape component beta CT. We rescale it to make it union length. This makes the shape component 
become scale invariant because now every tumor contour has unit length. On the other hand, for intensity component, we normalize it by subtracting its mean and divided by its standard deviation for each patient and for each MRI modality. This is to deal with a well-known issue with MRI, which is that the same types of tissue under different MRI scans, even with the same parameter settings and the same protocol can have different intensity scales. So after standardization, we then additionally attach a control parameter lambda to the standardized intensity function and arrives at the standardized 3D closed curve representation, beta star lambda t. So now this representation combines shape and intensity information such that we can study them jointly. This representation also allows for balance of information, which is controlled by the parameter lambda. And this balance of information will become useful when we make comparisons of tumor shape and intensity. So let's now first consider how rotation and reparameterization can affect the comparisons of tumor shape and intensity under the current representation. Consider a rotation group, which is a subgroup of the special orthogonal group containing elements that rotate only the first two coordinates that corresponds to the shape component of the representation with the group action that is pre-multiplication of the orthogonal matrix in this group. So in, in well, we, here we only consider subgroup because we only want to rotate the xy coordinates of the tumor contour, not the intensity coordinate, because that would change the magnitude of the intensity values. Let's also consider reparameterization group, which is a set that contains a vertebral smooth function that maps from unit circle to unit circle, and its inverse are also smooth. The corresponding group action is right composition. So we can compare two tumors or quantify the difference in the two tumors under the current representation using a distance, such as L2 distance. However, using L2 distance to quantify the difference in the two tumors under the current representation is not isometric under the action of three parameterization group. This means that the L2 distance between these tumors changes if we reparameterize them both the same way. So this is not ideal for statistical analysis. Of course, we can use a parameterization invariant distance, such as elastic Riemannian metric for comparisons. However, this is difficult to compute in practice. And that is why we convert the current representation to the square, square root velocity or SRV representation. This conversion is helpful because the elastic metric, which is parameterization invariant, on the previous representation simplifies to L2 metric under the SRV representation, which becomes easier to compute in practice. In addition, the SRV representation is automatically invariant to translation because in the calculation, we take the component-wise derivatives of the previous representation beta star lambda t. So now we remove the variability due to translation in our representation. Importantly, Comparisons using L2 distance under the SRV representation become invariant to rotation and reparameterization, or isometric under the actions of rotation and reparameterization, reparameterization groups with the corresponding new group actions. So now this is ideal for statistical analysis. So then we can define the space of SRV denoted by script C and define the distance on this space, which is just the L2 distance. So this distance we define here is going to be helpful for us to find to define a new distance on the next space I'm going to discuss. So, so far, our representation, namely the SRV representation, is scale invariant in the shape component and is translation invariant in the shape and intensity components. To further account for the variability due to rotation in the shape component and reparameterization in both shape and intensity components, we define a equivalence class or a set that identifies all the possible different rotated and reparameterized versions of a tumor with each other. This equivalence class representation of shape and intensity provides us with a objective characterization of tumor shape and intensity because each equivalence class is a unique representation of GBM tumor shape and intensity. Then we can define the space of all such equivalence classes 
denoted by script S for the space of all unique tumor shape and intensity and define the distance on this space, which is based on the distance on the previous space of SRV. And because of the isometric properties of the distance on the space of SRV, this distance we define here is also going to be a variant to rotation and reparameterization. Importantly, this procedure registers or align one tumor representation to another, and this results in improved comparison. And whether compared, this comparison focuses more on shape difference or the intensity difference depends on the choice of lambda you specify in the representation. We can look at registration results to visualize how our distance results in improved comparison and how values of lambda can affect the comparisons of tumors. So here, the graph on the left shows the standardized shape and intensity of tumors from two patients. And the graph in the middle and on the right shows the registration result with small and large values of lambda, respectively. And here we are re registering the red curve to the blue curve. As you can see from the middle graph, where the lambda is small, registration is driven by shape component as the geometric feature of the tumor shape are aligned. So, and here the distance focuses more on shape difference. On the other hand, when lambda increases, as you can see from the graph on the right, the role of intensity component becomes stronger in registration. As you can see, the intensity function become more aligned as compared to the geometric features of the tumors. And now the distance focuses more on the difference in intensity. We can also look at geodesic plots or the optimal path of deformation between two tumors to visualize how values of lambda can affect the comparisons of tumors. So here, each row represents a optimal path that starts from one tumor, follows by six intermediate points along the path, and ends at, ends at another tumor that is registered to the starting tumor for a specific value of lambda. And as you go down the row, the lambda value increases. And in this plot, the tumor contour represents the shape component, and the color pixel on the tumor contours represent the intensity components. So this plot suggests that the formation is influenced by the choice of lambda because as you can see at the top row, while deforming from one tumor to another, the geometric features of the tumor contours are preserved as much as possible. On the other hand, as lambda increases, as you can see in the bottom row, when lambda is 0.5, while one tumor is deforming to another, the matching of the intensity values become more important than preserving the geometric features of the tumor contours along the path. So our proposed representation and distance can allow us to assess GVN tumor heterogeneity with respect to GVN tumor shape and intensity. To do this, we, we use our distance to implement hierarchical clustering with complete linkage for different values of lambda. And whether the clustering focuses more on shape difference or intensity difference depends on the choice of lambda. And after clustering observations into two groups, we then estimate the median survival time in the two groups and compare the two groups. So here the graph on the left shows the absolute difference in median survival time for different values of lambda between the two groups that are clustered either using, using uh, T1 data or using T2 flare data. As you can see from this graph, the largest difference in median survival occurs at lambda is equal to 0.12 when clustering is based on T1 data. This corresponds to more emphasis on shape difference when clustering using T1 data. On the other hand, the largest difference in median survival occurs at lambda is equal to 0.5 when clustering is based on T2 flare data. This corresponds to more emphasis on intensity difference. Importantly, these two largest differences occur when the two groups have balanced sample sizes. This suggests that these are statistically reliable results. So the clustering result and the subsequent survival analysis result suggests that with a certain emphasis on the intensity information, we can identify two groups with distinct survival and balanced sample sizes. So that's one example of using our distance and representation to conduct joint statistical analysis of shape and intensity. Aside from that, we can also perform other joint statistical analysis of GBN tumor shape and intensity such as taking the average or summarizing the, the variability of tumor shape and intensity 
Also, our proposed approach is not restricted to MRI-derived CBM tumor shape and intensity. It can also be applied to other medical imaging modalities in various diagnostic contexts. And that concludes my presentation. Let us thank our speaker. We'll have to hold questions on this schedule. Thank you so much. Who wants to come up? Okay, I think it's all yours. Hello, my name is Ankrin, and today I'll be presenting my work on robust hierarchical symbolic explanations in hyperbolic space for image classification. Okay, so I'll first give a brief overview of symbolic reasoning. In symbolic reasoning, we represent the world as discrete concepts and entities and we reason about these yeah. concepts and, and entities through the relations between these concepts now in ilp terms inductive logical programming we describe these relations as predicates and predicates applied to entities are called atoms now the relationships between these concepts often have a global structure so on the right we have a linear form of reasoning here governed by the bigger than predicate. On the left, we have a circular form of reasoning, the colors, and in the middle, we have hierarchical symbolic reasoning. In this work, we focus on hierarchical symbolic reasoning. And the reason why is because we, we hypothesize the way we reason about images is through hierarchical symbolic reasoning and make classification decisions based on hierarchical symbolic reasoning. And there are many works in neuroscience which supports this hypothesis. In this work, we wanted to distill the knowledge in a deep discriminative model, whereby reasoning is not well defined, into a knowledge tree. Then given an image, we can transverse this knowledge tree to extract chain rules, which provide explanations for these classifiers. The chain rule comes in the form of this expression here. So the first atom in this chain rule is shown here, and it's governed by the exist predicate, which is saying that these low abstraction symbols in the first layer of our knowledge tree exist in this image. We then merge these lower abstraction symbols to form higher abstraction symbols until we get to the class. Now, this is governed by the rest of the atoms in this, in this expression, governed by the part of predicate. So for example, here, we are saying this symbol sample from the first layer of our knowledge tree is part of the symbol, this symbol here, which is from the next level of our knowledge tree. In this work, we consider the curvature in which we want to embed these symbols. Uh, in our work, because the knowledge tree grows exponentially large from the class, we propose to embed our symbols in hyperbolic geometry. And the reason why we do this is because the volume in hyperbolic geometry grows exponentially from the center, whereas in Euclidean space, it grows quadratically. Therefore, we predict that we can embed these symbols more efficiently in hyperbolic space with reduced distortion and less overlap. I will now give a brief overview of hyperbolic geometry. So in hyperbolic geometry, we can model it with five different types of models, but in this work, we focus on two different types, the Poincare model and the hyperboloid. We look at hyperbolic geometry through the differential geometric perspective. So, and if you want to do this, we need to define something called the Romanian metric tensor, which basically describes, which is basically gives you all the collection of dot products over the manifold. And this governs properties such as length, area, volume, angles, etc. Now the, the metric tensor, remaining metric tensor for a hyperboloid is something called the Minkowski metric tensor. The Minkowski metric tensor is similar to the Euclidean metric tensor. So the Euclidean metric tensor is basically the identity matrix, except in the Minkowski metric tensor, we swap the first element in the diagonal with minus one, and we end up with this equation here. Using this metric tensor, we can derive a formula for the distance between two vectors in the hyperboloid governed by this arc cosh function here. 
Now, Poincare space is conformal to Euclidean space. Therefore, this means basically that angles are preserved when we map from Poincare space to Euclidean space and vice versa. So the metric tensor for Poincare space is given by the dot product of two vectors in Poincare space, like in Euclidean space, but scaled by this conformal factor here. Again, using this formula, we can then derive a, a, di a distance formula between two points in Poincare space shown here. We are also going to want to perform linear mappings in hyperbolic, hyperbolic space. And the way we do it in this work is that we map from the hyperbolic space to the tangent space defined at the origin. And the way we do this is something by something called the logarithmic mapping, which for the Poincare model is shown here, and for the hyperboloid is shown here. And we're also going to want to map back from the tangent space to hyperbolic space. And we do this through exponential mappings shown here for Poincare for Poincare space, and in this equation here for the hyperboloid. We now have all the ingredients to understand our method. So what we do, this is a brief overview. So what we do is we map an image to a continuous latent space using a, uh, a pre-trained feature extractor. We collapse this continuous latent space to a finite number of vectors using vector quantization to construct the Euclidean code book. We then map from the Euclidean code book to the first hyperbolic code book. This first hyperbolic code book forms the first level or layer of our knowledge tree. We then merge symbols from this hyperbolic code book to form the next hyperbolic code book, which forms the second level of our knowledge tree. And we do this continuously until we get to the last hyperbolic code book. Now, given an image, we consecutively sample each of these hyperbolic code book to drive chain rules as explanations for our classifier. And then we can visualize any symbol in our chain rule using the decoder. I'm going to give I'm going to go in a bit more detail for each of the parts of our method. So symbol formation, how we do it? We do it, as I described, using vector quantization. And what we do is here essentially is we minimize the distance between each of the features in our continuous latent space with its nearest vector in the Euclidean code book. Then we replace each of the features in the continuous latent space with its nearest component in the Euclidean code book to form ZQ, shown here. Then what we do is when we perform the first hyperbolic code book, we first do a linear mapping and then an exponential mapping to form the first hyperbolic code book. We do the same thing for ZQ. And then we sample the first hyperbolic code book based on the Poincare distance because our, uh, our hyperbolic code books are in Poincare space. And this forms Z hat here. And what we're doing is by sampling the first hyperbolic code book, we are essentially constructing the first atom in our chain rule, which is governed by the exist predicate. Therefore, by sampling the first hyperbolic code book, we are saying that these lower abstraction symbols exist in our image. So how do we form the rest of the hyperbolic code books? So what we do is uh, we first map the first hyperbolic code book to Euclidean space using a logarithmic mapping. And then we want to decide which symbols to merge. And the way we do this is using a binary neural network layer, whereby a weight of one means there's an edge between a symbol from one hyperbolic code book to the next. Once we learn this, we then form a weighted aggregation of symbols from one hyperbolic code book to the next, whereby edges exist. And then we map back to hyperbolic space using the exponential mappings. And we repeat this again until we get to the last hyperbolic code book. And this essentially collects, uh, constructs our knowledge tree in the hyperbolic space. And then given an image, we consecutively sample each of these hyperbolic code books followed by a linear layer. This essentially constructs a discretized latent space of increasingly abstract symbols. Given this, we can then derive a set of chain rules given an image, which together forms a local tree, which provides like a local level explanation per an image. By sampling the hyperbolic code books after the first, we are essentially constructing the atoms in our chain rule, which correspond to the part of predicate. We also want in our knowledge tree where, for, where there are edges between symbols to be close together in Poincare space and without where there's no edges between symbols to be far away in Poincare space and we enforce it with this Poincare loss here. And this is an example of a knowledge tree. So given an image, if we sample this symbol in the first layer of our knowledge tree and then sample this, symbol in the next layer of our knowledge tree, which corresponds to this class zero, we're essentially saying that this low abstraction symbol exists in our knowledge tree. And this is part of 
this symbol in the next level of knowledge tree, which corresponds to the class. We can also extract global level explanations as well, whereby we find all the chain rules which corresponds to a class. So, which hold true for a class. So if class one here, this chain rule holds true for class and this chain rule holds true for class. And together, this subtree forms a, a, a global level explanation for the class. So essentially, a local level explanation a and a global level explanation are subtrees of the knowledge tree. We then want to evaluate our method on different data sets. The first data set is the MNIST data set. And here you see the instance of the class two. We compare it to four different types of explainability methods, Lime, DeepLift, Sharp, and GradCam. And here you see in, for the class three, a global level explanation. We then have a local level explanation for this particular instance of class two. And in the first, in this example here, the first row here corresponds to the symbols in the first level of our knowledge tree, of our local tree, sorry. The second row corresponds to the second level of our local tree, and the last level corresponds to the third level of our local tree. And as you can see here, these lower abstraction symbols are being merged together to form uh, semantics of higher abstraction, essentially. And you can see compared to the other method, our method is having giving a multi-level explanation, which is essentially forming a reasoning over why we decided this is class two. We do the same thing here for AFHQ data set. We have an instance of, class, of the boat class. Here, again, you can see lower abstraction symbols being merged together to form higher level semantics. We then want to see why uh, hyperbolic space is better than Euclidean space. Firstly, you can see it's visually more appeasing by, by visualizing the 2D concave bedding. So you can see the hierarchical structure. We then evaluate the knowledge distillation, distillation accuracy, which is basically saying how faithful our explanation is to the classifier. And you can see here that in Poincare space, we have higher knowledge distillation accuracy, which gets bigger compared to Euclidean space as we reduce the dimensionality. The reason for this is shown in the next table here, whereby we visualize, we want to measure the overlap of symbols in the output space. And you can see, I mean, the way we measure overlap is the dice overlap. And you can see here, there's less overlap between symbols in Poincare space compared to Euclidean space which grows larger, the difference grows larger between Poincare and Euclidean space as we reduce the dimensionality. And this is shown we can embed our symbols more efficiently in Poincare space with less overlap and distortion. In the last set of experiments, we want to analyze the robustness of our explanations. So we essentially apply Gaussian perturbations in the input space and see how our explanations vary. And you can see here in the table below when we add Gaussian noise, there's very limited variance in our explanations compared to the other four methods. And if you see an example here, and we add 30% Gaussian noise. And compared to the other four methods, you can see the explanation change a bit here and here. Whereas in our method, we're sampling the same symbol again, despite 30% Gaussian noise, meaning there's no change in the explanations. In conclusion, we devise a method to construct hierarchical symbolic explanations for deep discriminative models. We consider the curvature with which we embed our symbols. And in our work, we decide to embed our symbols in hyperbolic geometry. We show by doing this, we can derive more robust and unique explanations for classifiers. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for our speaker? Is there like a limit to this method? A limit? Yes. So uh, uh, our method, you can use a, the user can design the level, the number of extractions you want. So you can have a five level, six level, seven level tree. Uh, by theory, but computationally, because the way we are constructing these symbols, we're using straight through gradient approximation, we are sampling, right? Because if you're sampling, we're going to apply to straight through gradient approximations, and that will work well uh, up to a certain number of level of abstractions. If you go too deep, the gradients don't really mean anything because you're doing the straight through gradient approximation, approximation. So there is a limit to how far the abstraction can go without the before the gradients start losing meaning, basically. Is, is there any sort of uh, theoretical results that that's or anything? I haven't looked at that, but it'll be interesting to look at the intrinsic dimension in the manifold and seeing how well it, it, it basically measuring that intrinsic dimension of the manifold, depending on the number of symbols we decide to embed. But I haven't looked at that now. Thank you for that interesting talk. Thank you. And our last talk is virtual. If that speaker is online, if, if they could start sharing and do an audio check. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, can you hear me?
Yes, we, we can hear you. Okay. So. Okay, great. So, um, hi everyone. I'm Kalyan, and I'll be presenting our paper on using the order characteristic transform as a new topological loss for improved 2D to 3D reconstructions. So, this work was done as part of my master thesis under Professor Amit and Professor Bastian. The problem statement we consider is given a single uh, 2D image of a slice, can we reconstruct its entire 3D shape? And why this is useful is um, for clinicians because they can use the 3D cell shapes to predict certain pathologies, which is called morphological analysis. A quote from a well-known paper in this domain, which I'm just paraphrasing, says that um, morphological analysis on red blood cell data can be a key tool for lab professionals to recommend treatment. The problem, however, is really challenging. The first aspect is that the solution space is ambiguous. Uh, for a single image, there's infinite possible reconstructions. The second is that compared to other domains where object reconstruction and scene reconstruction is studied, um, the, there's orders of magnitude smaller amount of data here. For example, in the data sets we consider in this biomedical domain, um, there's approximately like 800 images each. And the third is uh, we can't really use transfer learning here because there's no large model in this domain. Uh, using a model that can reconstruct, um, say, like natural scenes has too much of a domain shift. Sorry. So um, the scope of our work falls under the rising field of topological optimization. Here, um, what we aim to do is improve upon common computer vision losses like the binary cross entropy, dice loss, et cetera, because all of these just optimize for pixel wise losses. They don't really capture more global and structural properties. The grand promise of topological optimization is that we can directly optimize for these global and structural properties. So our hope in this task specifically is that this would serve as a strong inductive bias or regularizer, and that would give us more faithful reconstructions in the design of limited data. Um, here's our full pipeline. Uh, here we, given a story image, we pass it through a neural network. And in our case, we use this specific instance called the Schaper model. Uh, which is the just the first computer vision paper that introduces this task. And Chapa outputs a 3D prediction upon which we computed geometric loss like the binary cross entropy. And we just, um, this is where a standard computer vision pipeline would stop. We just backdrop these gradients and improve, I mean, train a neural network. But in our work, what we do is we incorporate topological loss as well, where we also compute the distance between topological features of both the ground truth and a predicted shape and compute the distance between them. So we train our neural network combining these two losses. And this can be seen in our equation where we sum up the geometric loss with the scale variant of the topological loss. So the order characteristic is a topological variant, uh, invariant, which is defined as the sum of the number of vertices minus the edges plus the faces and so on. Um, since it's a topological invariant, it manages to capture global properties of the shape. And by the formula, it's very, I mean, it's easy to see that it's very cheap to compute as well. So how do we actually compute this um, though for like general space and manifolds, like say take a sphere. Um, in this case, what are the faces, edges, et cetera? Um, what we do is to make this computationally feasible is we triangulate the space into a set of triangles. Uh, formally, this is a simplicial complex. So if you compute the Euler characteristic on this triangulate space, you would get the um, correct answer for the sphere. The simplicial complex are just sets of simplices, um, which are just different dimensional triangles, like points, edges, triangles, and tetrahedrons. But in our specific case, um, we're dealing with images. Uh, can we exploit this grid-like structure? And the answer is yes, we use squares instead of triangles. And this is something called a cubical complex. So analogous to a, a simplicial complex, but instead of just using triangles and higher order triangles, we use squares and cubes and so on. So below is an example where we can convert an image to a cubic complex. And how you do this is you consider all the non-zero vertices as your set of um, non-zero pixels as your set of vertices and any adjacent vertices as your set of edges and so on. That's how you build it up. So um, another important definition is um, 
of a fill patient. So a fill patient is just an increasing sequence of complexes that informally allows you to grow your complex. So through this example, let's try understanding this, um, which this is a specific instance called the height filtration. Um, we consider a function defined on the simplices as the height of the simplices. And for a height threshold hedge, what you look at is the subcomplex uh, you obtain by only considering simplices with height less than hedge. So as you can see, as you increase your threshold hedge, you get an increasing sequence of simplistic complexes, which is our height filtration. So finally, to the main stuff. Um, so this is work by like Catherine Turner et al, uh, where they define something called the Euler curve. Um, informally, all the Euler curve is is just along a particular direction you consider height filtration, and for each subcomplex, compute its Euler characteristic. So in practice, we can't really um, we don't um, get this continuous function. We just approximate this by taking n equally spaced height values. So um, the ECT is just an extension of this, where instead of taking one particular direction, let's just consider the infinite set of all possible directions, and for each compute the Euler curve. Again, in practice, we just use m finitely, um, m finite randomly sampled directions. So for our loss, uh, we want the distance between two ECTs, and this distance is just defined as the L2 norm between the two ECTs. Mathematically, that is just um, integrate over all directions, and for each direction, take the L2 difference between the corresponding Euler curves. In practice, though, we just take the L2 distance between the finite approximations that we've got. So we also um, show some uh, one theoretical result that the distance between ECTs over cubal complex is constructed over binary images bounded. If two images differ at k voxels, um, then we can bound the distance between the k, uh, const between the, the ECTs by some constant into that value k. Um, in our experiments, we consider two data sets used in the prior work, namely the uh, nuclei and red blood cell data sets, both of which have approximately 800 images each. And since the data set size is really small, we perform five-fold cross-validation to get more accurate evaluation results. And we compare three different methods. The first is the baseline neural network model, which was Shaper. The second is Shaper trained in combination with a uh, persistence diagram based loss. Um, essentially, all that is is we compute the persistence diagram of the ground truth and the reconstructed image. And we try to minimize the Wasserstein time distance between those. And the final is um, Shaper plus our ECT loss. So uh, this, these are our result tables. Um, you can see that though for IOU error, we don't do much better. We, we're just slightly better on one and we're not better on the other. However, we see um, significant improvements on the volume and surface error. So for the volume error, um, we get around like 10% improvement for the RBC and around uh, 15 or 20% on the nuclear data set. And for the surface error, we get approximately um, I think it's 15% here and 10% here improvement. Finally, here are some qualitative results that we have. So you can visualize the outputs of our of the various method on the two data sets. So for our nuclei results, uh, one interesting thing to observe is that the topological based methods do significantly better. They don't actually produce um, these extra artifacts. And this isn't this just this one image. This is something that we observed through the data set. I mean, there's only one component. And on the right, we have our red blood cell based results where, um, though, my, I mean, none of them are perfect, the ECT and the Wasserstein try to capture the curvature and that dip in the value. And that concludes my work. Thank you for it. Do we have any questions for our speaker? I guess I was curious for the, you said the calculation of the topological loss was um, was very computationally tractable. Was the geometric as well? Yeah, so the geometric is just standard um, pixelized losses, which is already used. And those are just like linear time losses as well. So like all we've done is taken existing computation pipelines and appended this new topological loss. 
Thank you. Are any other questions in the room or online? Okay. Let us thank our speaker one more time. Sure. Um, this one question in the chat. Oh, there. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the persistence diagram base loss is based on homology, but apart from that, no, I've not really tried any other. This is just the first one because um, this is just a lot cheaper the ECT. So we thought, let's see how powerful it could be. Thanks so much. Yeah. We're going to take a pause here for two minutes or so, and then we'll pull up some concluding remarks. Going to end the online portion. Okay. So, you know, arguably the most important part. Where's the social hour happening? Um, so this is the information for where we're going to be having um, our informal social hour starting at five o'clock. Um, when you get there, you can either say my name or you can mention tag DS. They have a party room that they've reserved for us and we will have a designated server. Um, because they, they were willing to work with us at the last minute, please try not to go around that server and go and order things directly from the bar or someone else. Um, since they've actually allocated her to that space. Um, we'll also be posting a link to this on Twitter um, for people to get there, but it is just across the street um, within a couple of blocks. So um, if you have any questions on that. Um, and then kind of to set the tone the same way we started, right? none of these workshops are possible without having people here participating from both a reviewer standpoint, um, a submitter standpoint and others. So thank you all for being here. Um, we often make the joke that tag we're it, but so are you. Thank you, everyone. I'll leave it up here and it will, we'll hang around if anybody has any other topics or things like that. We had a tentative discussion panel planned um, that with some of the various tech logistics and things that happened today, we ended up removing that from the schedule. So um, it has been updated accordingly. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>